Bueno, nuevamente buenos días a todos y a todas. Eh, les quiero dar la bienvenida a esta reunión de mecanismos regionales e internacionales para el abordaje integral de la violencia contra las mujeres y las niñas que se celebra por primera vez en la OEA. Esta, esta reunión eh, va a originar un mecanismo institucional que vamos a ir consolidando y que va a permitir tener más cooperación para luchar contra la violencia hacia las mujeres. Y quiero agradecerle al secretario general que dentro de toda su súper ocupada agenda haya podido estar con nosotros hoy. Secretario, ¿le puedo dar la palabra? Nuestra región y su cultura patriarcal siguen reproduciendo y profundizando contra valores que desvirtúan y desconocen el papel de las mujeres en nuestras vidas. Es hora de hacer realidad promesas de igualdad, es hora de cambiar el rumbo para ello. Amigas y amigos, en las últimas semanas una mujer fue lanzada por un balcón en Venezuela. Una niña de dos años fue violada en Perú. Una joven fue asesinada en Argentina. Una mujer adulta fue violada en un taxi en México. Y una líder social fue asesinada en Colombia. Es una historia sin fin a la que debemos luchar cada vez más fuerte para ponerle un final. Nuestra región y su cultura patriarcal están reproduciendo y profundizando esos contravalores que desvirtúan y desconocen ese papel de las mujeres. Siguen pregonando a través de currículos escolares, de juegos, de libros educativos, de propaganda y publicidad, una falsa superioridad de hombres sobre mujeres. Todas las convenciones, las leyes, los planes nacionales de igualdad, los tribunales especializados, aún no son suficientes para disminuir las graves cifras de violencia que azotan a nuestra región. La violencia contra las mujeres y niñas en la región es y sigue siendo uno de los fenómenos más preocupantes. La violencia física, la violencia sexual y la violencia femicida son aspectos de un fenómeno extendido que enluta a nuestros pueblos todos los días y que hace que se escuche con más fuerza el grito de ni una menos. Pero ese grito sigue siendo un grito que necesitamos que se escuche más fuerte. Aún miles de mujeres en la región siguen siendo víctimas de múltiples formas de violencia que buscan silenciar sus voces, sus cuerpos y los territorios que muchas de estas mujeres defienden. La violencia contra las mujeres y las niñas en la región nos ha convertido en una de las regiones con menores posibilidades de progreso y con democracias que se debilitan ante la ineficiencia de la justicia y el avance de la impunidad. Hoy en día nos enfrentamos a la amenaza del retroceso de valores y principios fundamentales a causa de odios e intolerancias que avivan violencias, como la que estamos hablando aquí. La agenda de la igualdad de género hoy es parte central de lo bueno en el mundo pero desde los ámbitos internacionales hasta los locales, enfrentamos nuevas formas de ataques de quienes quieren mantener un orden de supremacía masculina, una división sexual discriminatoria del trabajo y la subordinación de las mujeres. Ante ellos, debemos posicionarnos y avanzar firmemente y de manera decidida en la agenda de género, que en 2015 se reafirmó como objetivo de 193 países del mundo. Los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible constituyen un parte aguas en la historia de los acuerdos adoptados a nivel internacional, porque transversalizaron el enfoque de igualdad de género y reconocieron la violencia de género como un obstáculo al desarrollo. Por eso estamos aquí, compartiendo con las autoridades de los demás mecanismos internacionales y regionales especializados en combatir la violencia contra las mujeres, porque estamos seguros que es esencial avanzar de manera coordinada en los ámbitos nacionales, internacionales y regionales en el combate a la violencia de género. Para nosotros es un compromiso ser la primera región de contar con una convención como la Convención de Belén do Pará, 
y por ello hemos asumido con el mayor ahínco defender sus principios, en particular el derecho de todas las mujeres de vivir libre de violencia. Hemos propuesto la posibilidad de realizar una Asamblea General de la OEA dedicada a abordar los desafíos que el ejercicio de los derechos humanos de las mujeres representan en nuestra región. Y para ello esperamos en estos encuentros las más amplias coordinaciones y colaboraciones. Así en conjunto podremos enfrentar los embates contra la igualdad, nuestro bien común y avanzar en el logro de nuestros postulados, más derechos para más gente y más derechos para más mujeres. Gracias. Muchas gracias, secretario. Eh, ahora le voy a entregar la conducción de toda la reunión a la embajadora de Canadá, Jennifer López. No necesito leer su currículum, ella es muy conocida y en este momento además es la presidenta de, del Consejo Permanente. Entonces es para nosotros un honor que ella esté con, con, ah, presidiendo esta reunión y le agradecemos mucho. Embajadora, por favor. Okay. Oh, this works. Good. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. And thank you all uh, for being here. Thank you, Carmen, uh, for your introduction. And thank you very much, Mr. Secretary General, for your words, for setting the tone for us this morning. Um, so, as Carmen said, I'm, I'm Jennifer Lowden. I'm the Canadian ambassador to the OAS. I'm the first woman to hold that role and extremely proud of that and extremely aware of the responsibility that comes along with that. Uh, I think every woman who first steps into a leadership role feels that sense of, of pride and that sense of responsibility. So I'm extremely pleased to be here today with this panel of incredible speakers uh, to address an issue of violence against women. But I do have to say I'm a tiny bit disappointed as well. The reason for that is this is an issue that I've worked on my entire career. Uh, when I first started, I was a program officer for violence against women for a tiny Canadian NGO that worked globally with women's organizations. And we did great work, and I was really proud. Then I worked on the Royal Commission for New Reproductive Technologies in Canada, and we did great work, and I was really proud. Then I worked for International Development Research Center in the gender mainstreaming section, talking to economists about why it mattered that we should use a feminist analysis, why gender mattered, and why violence against women was an economic issue as well as a human rights issue. And we did great work, and I was really proud. And on and on and on. And now here we are today, and the conversation remains to a large degree very similar. We have a lot of great mechanisms in place, and we're going to hear about that this morning. And I'm glad about that. And we need to talk about how we use those better. How can we coordinate? We cannot change the situation by ourselves. The other thing that I wanted to mention was For Canada, this is a tremendous priority. And I just said, we have to start to do things differently. Canada has recently announced a feminist foreign policy. And that feminist analysis will be at the heart of our foreign policy and our development policy. The reason for that is because we understand that this is a human rights issue. But also because we understand that it's time to do development and foreign policy differently. If we want to use these tools to change the way the world is, we have to change the way we do it. A feminist analysis allows us to look at the root causes of poverty. It allows us to open up the, the circle of inclusion and bring in more than just the 50% of the population that have dominated the conversation to date. To have our foreign policy and to have our development policy be feminist in nature changes the way we engage in the world. And I'm extremely proud of that, and I'm sure we'll do good work. But I'm also sure we'll make more progress than we have to date. So I'm joined here by a series of speakers who have been working also on this issue for their entire careers. And I hope today that we can hear from them about ways that we can all begin to do things differently, how we can build on the great work we've all done and change the conversation. Is this better? Oh. <laughs> Shall I start again? No. <laughs> Okay, anyway, um, so what we'll do now then is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn over the, the floor to the speakers that we have before us today. And we're incredibly lucky. We have some extremely uh, important activists, important uh, people who've worked in international movements to change the context of violence against women. 
And I would like to start with Dubravka Simonovic, who is the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women for the United Nations. I'm going to ask her just to say a few words about her work and what she does, and then we'll turn the floor over to our other panels in order. And then just open it up a little bit to you and to the panelists to have a conversation on how do we improve the way we work together? How do we change the conversation? How do we change the story of violence against women? Dubravka, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Let me start by congratulating you on your position that you have here. And uh, let me um, greet the Secretary General and all of you present and state that as the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, its causes and consequences, I am very great, grateful to be here this morning at this important panel that is going to examine linkages between global and regional mechanisms that are dealing with women's rights and violence against women. It was stated by our moderator that we need to find a new way how to address violence against women, how to prevent violence against women. And I'm deeply convinced that violence against women is preventable and that we need to use all those agendas global instruments, regional instruments, and mechanisms in a better manner. We need to connect better. We need to find a way how to use synergies between global and regional instruments in order to produce concrete results at a national level, at the level of communities, and to make difference for each and every woman and girl child, for all those that are affected by violence against women. Let me start at my mandate of a special rapporteur on violence against women, its causes and consequences, was um, established in 1994 by uh, United Nations Commission on Human Rights. And at that time, violence against women was not recognized as a human rights violation. So that was recognized by states as an important step in order to send a message that violence against women is a human rights violation and should be addressed by human rights bodies under the human rights framework. Now, so many years later, we are at a stage where we are able to see how global agendas are operating. I am now referring to CEDAW Convention, um, Declaration on Elimination of Violence Against Women, Beijing Platform for Action, United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325, but also regional mechanisms that are also building this international framework. Regional mechanisms like Convention Belem do Para, um, Maputo Protocol, Istanbul Convention are giving additional substance to global mechanisms that we already have in this, in this level. So as a United Nations Special Rapporteur, I am entrusted to provide recommendations to states with respect to elimination of violence against women. And when I am traveling to states, when I am um, introducing my recommendations, I am using global and regional mechanisms and instruments jointly. So for that reason, um, Last year, when I um, started my um, mandate, I have launched initiative uh, related to better cooperation between global and regional mechanisms in order to send the message that now, at this stage, it is not sufficient just to use this fragmented approach that we had up to now, that now it is time for synergies, for cooperation, and for clear results in a shorter term. We need to accelerate progress. And my mandate is extremely grateful to Organization of American States for um, organizing this panel and this meeting. Um, that is the first step in that direction. It is a long way for us to go to establish this institutional cooperation between global and regional mechanisms, to have support from regional and global organizations, and to have support from all member states. So it is a long way to go, but this is very important first step, and we are very much encouraged by, by support that we have received this morning by the Secretary General of Organization of American States, and we hope to have further support from all others. Um, just to mention that Secretary General of United Nations, Mr. Guterres, last uh, time when we uh, had a meeting with him during the Commission on the Status of Women, he also, in principle, supported this initiative. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dubrovka. I'd like now to ask uh, Celia Mesa, who is uh, the Vice President of the Committee of Experts of the Follow-Up Mechanism for the Belém du Pará Convention. Very familiar to those of us here, the Mesesic uh, Organization. I'd like you to say a few words about how that operates and perhaps react a bit to what Dubrovka said about regional and global organisms. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning and thank you very much for being here. Voy a hablar en español. <laughs> ya me había puesto el cassette del inglés, entonces ahora me cambio. Eh, para nosotras es muy importante este acontecimiento porque nos permite compartir nuestra experiencia en el seguimiento de nuestro eh, instrumento internacional. La Convención de Belén do Pará, aprobada en 1994, es pionera en el mundo porque es el primer instrumento internacional que se dirige directamente a tratar la problemática de la violencia contra las mujeres. Y además define la violencia contra las mujeres eh, siguiendo la idea de que se trata de una violación de derechos de, de los humanos, pero además que se fundamenta, y esto es sumamente importante, establece la causa de la violencia contra las mujeres, está basada en las relaciones históricamente desiguales de poder existentes entre las mujeres y los hombres. Y ese es el eje sobre el cual tenemos que trabajar, el análisis de poder existente en la violencia contra las mujeres. Y además la convención y me parece que esto también es nuevo, establece tres áreas, donde tres ámbitos de aplicación, que es el tradicional de la familia de las relaciones interpersonales y luego un ámbito de comunidad donde se da muchísima violencia contra las mujeres, el caso de la violación, de la trata de personas, de la prostitución forzada, de la, del hostigamiento sexual. Y por último, un tercer ámbito, que es la violencia perpetrada o tolerada por el Estado o sus agentes. En ese marco, eh, diez años después de la sanción de la Convención, se estableció un mecanismo para darle seguimiento porque muy bonita la convención, pero si no seguimos las, las obligaciones que la comisión establece para los estados y vemos cuáles son los avances, no nos sirve de nada tenerla. Entonces, se establece un mecanismo conformado por dos instancias. Hay una conferencia de estados partes donde se presenta una persona, que es la delegada de cada estado firmante de la convención, son 32 estados, o sea, casi todos los de las Américas con dos excepciones, y además, paralelamente, se establece un comité de expertas. Las expertas somos personas independientes, muchas de la sociedad civil, que analizamos la convención y analizamos el cumplimiento de la misma. ¿Por qué expertas independientes? Porque los estados, si no, nunca nos dirían lo que realmente está pasando. La única forma que conoce, de conocer lo que está pasando a nivel continental con la violencia contra las mujeres es mediante la auditoría que realiza la sociedad civil. Por eso las expertas tienen que ser independientes y no funcionarias de los estados. Se diseñó un mecanismo de evaluación de la convención que consta, se realizan rondas de evaluación en este momento estamos a mitad de la tercera ronda de evaluación. Cada ronda de evaluación tiene dos etapas. Una primera en la cual se hace la, la, la primera evaluación con un informe que presenta a los países y que es analizado por las expertas. Hasta el momento se han entregado 75 informes de los países que han sido en, analizados y se han hecho ya cuatro informes que están aprobados, o sea, en cada ronda se hacen dos informes, el informe hemisférico que se hace en el, a partir de las evaluaciones presentadas por los, infor, por, por los países, y luego se hace una ronda de seguimiento en la cual los países responden a las, eh, a las observaciones que les realizan las expertas y se hace el informe de seguimiento. Tenemos cuatro informes aprobados y el quinto informe en proceso de aprobación, que es el de la primera etapa de la tercera ronda de evaluación. Además de eso, el comité ha trabajado en la elaboración de informes temáticos, eh, produjimos el año pasado y está en, en la página del MEXEVI, un informe temático sobre el embarazo en las niñas y, eh, y la violencia sexual contra las niñas. 
que me parece que es un elemento importantísimo para analizar una de las formas de violencia contra las niñas más oculta y de la que menos se habla en nuestro continente. Además, el comité realiza de, eh, declaraciones, tenemos cinco declaraciones, una sobre femicidio, una sobre violencia política, una sobre, me voy a olvidar de alguna, ¿verdad?, eh, sobre derechos sexuales y reproductivos y, y, y violencia sexual, y me van a faltar otras dos que no me voy a acordar. Eh, y se hacen asistencias a los países. En este momento hemos estado trabajando en la elaboración de dos leyes modelos, una sobre violencia política contra las mujeres y la otra sobre femicidios. Y realmente el, el asunto del femicidio es una de las problemáticas más graves que vivimos en, en relación a la violencia contra las mujeres. Y es una de las cosas que queríamos, querríamos poder trabajar en conjunto con los otros mecanismos. Entonces, bueno, creo que por aquí dejo para dar espacio. Gracias. Thank you very much, Silvia. Muy bien, gracias. Uh, okay, well, thank you very much, Sylvia. And we've heard now a little bit from the Special Rapporteur from the UN in a global context, uh, a little bit about our own uh, hemispheric framework and uh, priorities. And I would like now to introduce uh, Ferede Akar. She is the president of the Group of Experts on Action Against Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence from the Council of Europe. So the European counterpart uh, to some degree to the Messigvi. And I would like now to ask you please to just a few comments on how your organization functions and then we'll uh, turn it over to Paloma Brown for some final introductory comments before we open up a discussion. Faride, please. <coughs> Thank you. Do I need to borrow that? Or? Is this all right? Can you, uh, uh, Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here, and I would like to uh, say a few words about uh, Council of Europe's work and our work as Gravio uh, regarding uh, what is being done uh, on the European uh, level with uh, regard to violence against women. Now, uh, Gravio is the monitoring organ of the Council of Europe Convention that, is, uh, that has a long name. It is called uh, the Council of Europe Convention on Prevention and on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and uh, Domestic Violence. It is shortly referred to as the Istanbul Convention. So from now on, I will refer to it as the Istanbul Convention. Now, uh, the Istanbul Convention and Gravio has an advantage. Uh, as was already pointed out by Silvia, uh, Belem de Para is the first expressly, uh, I mean, the first convention on violence against women that is dealing expressly with that issue. But uh, the Istanbul Convention is, as I call it, the new kid on the block. So we benefit from the experience of all those who have gone before us, as well as building on uh, their, uh, um, the accumulation there. Uh, having said that, let me say that the Istanbul Convention is a, a, is a human rights convention, it's a criminal law convention, and it is a convention that deals with gender equality. It is the only convention, it is the only legally binding instrument that exists uh, in the world that states that uh, violence against women is a cause and consequence of gender inequality. And it is also the first and only legally binding instrument in the world that gives uh, the definition of gender as a socially constructed category. So these are uh, uh, some of the major advances accomplished by the Istanbul Convention. The Convention is also, uh, uh, also constructs, uh, brings forth a very robust monitoring body. The kind of, so we do a lot of monitoring too, which I will explain uh, in a moment. Now, the Council of Europe has 47 member states. At the present time, the Istanbul Convention is ratified by uh, 26 member states of the Council of Europe. Another 18 are, uh, have signed uh, the convention, are in the process of um, uh, completing their uh, ratification procedures. 
and uh, past summer uh, the EU, the European Union, uh, as European Union, also signed the Istanbul Convention and is in the process of completing its ratification uh, processes. Now, uh, the convention is monitored by a group of independent experts, shortly referred to as Gravio, of which I have the honor of being the president. Uh, Gravio is made up currently of uh, 10 independent experts. Uh, it will soon become uh, 15 with new elections, adding five more members because the ratification of the convention has now reached past 25 uh, states. Uh, Gravio has been operating basically with, uh, in this uh, context since 2015. And in the period that we have been in operation, this group of experts has provided its own methods of work and uh, the um, I, I has started its work by constructing first a baseline questionnaire which was sent to all the uh, state uh, parties to the convention to establish where things are with regards to violence against women uh, in all the countries. And uh, then uh, the actual monitoring process started with two countries uh, at a time. We're taking them uh, two by two, so to speak. And the first two countries to go were um, Austria and Monaco. Their reports uh, to the questionnaire, this extensive questionnaire that has more than about 100 uh, questions, uh, was studied by Gravio. There is a dialogue that goes on with state uh, representatives who come and report to the uh, Committee of Experts in Strasbourg. And uh, we do accept, of course, and are very happy to have uh, civil society reports, the so-called shadow reports from NGOs. And then, in addition to this process, uh, and this is why I believe it's a a very robust monitoring process. Uh, Gravio ha Istanbul Convention provides the ability for Gravio to send a delegation to the uh, state that is being mo uh, monitored and to have further um, uh, contact with the authorities there, with civil society, to see the services uh, offered and all that. And once that is uh, also done, uh, Gravio produces its own report, which then is communicated to the state party and uh, to the national parliaments of the state party too. This is another uh, novelty of the, uh, of the Istanbul Convention. The Istanbul Convention is based on four very important principles, and I briefly uh, say them. The three Ps that everybody uh, always talks about, prevention, protection and prosecution, of course, in uh, dealing with um, uh, the violence against women issues. But uh, it also emphasizes very much a fourth P, which is uh, policy, integrated policy. And in fact, this is one of the main um, uh, legs, I would say, on which this convention stands. It emphasizes very much, for instance, that every state establish at the outset a coordinating body that is properly resourced financially and uh, staff-wise uh, to coordinate the activities that, uh, on, uh, that have to go in different parts of the state, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Health, the, um, um, the security services, whatever, uh, it, to have a coordinated response to uh, cases of violence against women. This body is also responsible for collecting uh, standardized and comparative uh, data on violence against women, which is something that we are really uh, needing uh, in the process. So the four legs of the Istanbul Convention working together uh, um, would ensure a, a, a sort of a, an effective response to uh, violence uh, against women. It, I would also like to say that the convention lists those uh, uh, 
actions that should be considered as crimes and as violence against women. They range from physical violence to sexual violence and rape, of course, but also include things like um, forced marriage, FGM, and uh, forced abortion or forced sterilization, and uh, stalking, which is uh, to be considered, including online uh, and uh, electronic stalking, so to speak. So it, is a, it has a full range of listings of the types of uh, violence against women, but also leaves room for other forms of violence that we may not know right now, but uh, we, would, uh, we, we seem to be um, uh, seeing every day a new form around the world <laughs> one way or the other. So uh, I think this is uh, what I would like to say at this point. But let me just add that after the two reports that are already out on Austria and Monaco, two others on Denmark and Albania are going to be out uh, in the next uh, um, couple of, uh, by the end of the year, I should say. And then uh, two other countries, uh, Turkey, and Montenegro are already the undergoing monitoring at this time. And uh, let me also uh, add that uh, the um, monitoring process of the Istanbul Convention is one of the strongest uh, points of this uh, element that I think benefits from the experience of uh, prior uh, examples that there is uh, this need for strong monitoring by regional uh, bodies and Istanbul Convention is in another way a child uh, a growth uh, of the international standards. My colleague Dubravka has already mentioned uh, the uh, CEDAW Committee's General Recommendation 19 on violence against women as starting the, this, uh, as putting this issue and of course also the um, uh, United Nations Declaration that establishes her mandate on violence against women. These were the pioneer uh, global uh, statements. The Istanbul Convention takes from those and makes what used to be soft law in international law into a legally binding standard for the European region. And I will end up by saying that it's not only for Europe. Uh, the um, I, uh, Istanbul Convention can be uh, joined by countries outside of the, uh, who are not members of the uh, Council of Europe. And already there is a lot of interest in this uh, convention by uh, the neighboring countries, particularly from the MENA region and from North Africa countries like Morocco and Tunisia uh, are uh, showing an interest in uh, learning and in adopting the standards of the Istanbul Convention to their own legislation with a view to uh, with possibly joining it in the future. Thank you. This one work? There. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Ferdi. I think already uh, from our three speakers, we're hearing about how these uh, initiatives build on one another and learn from one another. And Sylvia, I'm going to come back to you in a few minutes after we've heard from Paolo, just to ask you about how some of the things that we've heard about in the Istanbul Convention might uh, play out uh, within Latin America and in the MESIC-V environment. So uh, while Sylvia thinks about that tricky question, I'm going to introduce Paolo Abrao, well known to many of us here. He is the Executive Secretary of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which plays an important role in advancing human rights generally in the Americas, but specifically uh, the rights of women uh, in cooperation with the SIM. So Paolo, uh, if you please, a few words about uh, the Commission and how you might engage on this particular issue.
Hola. Opa. Ya, está mejor. Muy bien, muy bien. Bueno, buenos días, muchas gracias, embajadora Rotten. Quería agradecer mucho a la embajadora Carmen también, a la Comisión Interamericana de Mujeres, por la invitación a la CDH en participar de este evento, un momento muy relevante. De hecho, de manera muy sincera, quería expresar que la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos tenía mucha expectativa de involucrarse cada vez más con los demás mecanismos regionales e internacionales de protección de los derechos de las mujeres y hoy internamente dentro de la OEA también realizamos mucho esfuerzo para trabajar conjuntamente con todos los órganos correspondientes en la defensa de los derechos humanos y muy especialmente los derechos de las mujeres. La Comisión Interamericana tiene tres mandatos esenciales que están previstos en los documentos normativos de la organización. Nosotros tenemos un mandato de protección a los derechos humanos, un segundo mandato de monitoreo de la situación de los derechos humanos en los 35 países de las Américas eh, en distintos temas y también tenemos eh, el mandato de asistencia técnica y cooperación técnica a los estados para el desarrollo en materia de, de derechos humanos. Y, y bien, en, esa, en, esa, eh, en ese rol de, de mandatos y funciones, la Comisión mantiene una relatoría de, eh, sobre los derechos de las mujeres. Esa relatoría fue creada en 94 y, y bueno, es una de las relatorías más antiguas que la Comisión mantiene y hoy ejerce sus actividades en, en el marco de, las tres, de los tres mandatos esenciales de la Comisión Interamericana eh, por medio de un conjunto de mecanismos que son los mecanismos usuales que se utilizan en ámbito de la Comisión para alcanzar sus objetivos y sus, uh, y sus tareas. Estos, estos mecanismos pasan por distintas actividades. Una primera de ellas, en materia de protección, es el procesamiento de peticiones individuales. Mantenemos un sistema uh, uh, regional e internacional de protección de los derechos humanos. La Comisión procesa algunas peticiones individuales y en esa oportunidad eh, investigamos situaciones individuales de violencia contra las mujeres. Entonces hoy la Comisión tiene una gran amplitud eh, de situaciones que representan un conjunto de violaciones de derechos a las mujeres en la región y, y bueno, y algunos de los temas principales que normalmente aparecen, surgen en estas peticiones individuales para nosotros pasan por el tema del acceso a la justicia, sobre el tema de la impunidad, eh, situaciones de desapariciones, asesinatos, violencia sexual, discriminación, incluso violencia obstétrica también, hoy son casos que llegan a la Comisión Interamericana. Eh, la Comisión también tiene el rol de solicitar a los Estados que adoten medidas cautelares para la protección de situaciones de urgencia, situaciones de, de mucha gravedad, para evitar exactamente daños graves. Muchas veces la Comisión otorga una medida cautelar con carácter preventivo para se evitar un daño irreparable que puede surgir ante una determinada situación. Eh, la Comisión emite, ha emitido muchas medidas cautelares para protección de situaciones individuales y colectivas de mujeres en nuestra región. Eh, podemos hablar de eh, situaciones muy recientes, por ejemplo, eh, en Colombia, en Honduras, en, en Haití, en Nicaragua, en El Salvador, son situaciones concretas que la Comisión ha manifestado su decisión de, de obligar a los Estados a generar protección especial a estas mujeres. La Comisión también realiza visitas de trabajo, a igual de, otros, de manera similar a otros mecanismos regionales. Las, en las visitas de trabajo pueden ser generales sobre situación de los derechos humanos, pero también pueden ser particularizadas a determinados temas. En, 1900, en 2013 hicimos exactamente una visita... Eh, a cidade de Juárez, que foi exatamente sobre a situação de mulheres assassinadas. Então, foi uma situação bastante específica. Em Canadá também, o eh, tema das mulheres indígenas foi um objeto de atenção por parte da Comissão Interamericana. Eh, a Comissão pode expressar-se sobre situações da atualidade e busca hacerlos por meio de, de, de publicação de comunicados de prensa. Só este ano, nós temos publicado eh, um total de 12 pronunciamentos que se vinculam com a situação de las mujer, eh, de lo, de los direitos das mulheres na região, da situação de feminicídio, da situação de mulheres, das de mulheres defensoras dos de direitos humanos 
e também buscando a, é, visibilizar as boas práticas que determinados países estão realizando é, em defesa de los direitos das mulheres. Então, este ano, por exemplo, nós com muito gosto destacamos algumas iniciativas que o Estado de Chile ha realizado e que, à la luz de la mirada da Comissão, foram importantes para o rol da proteção das mulheres. A Comissão também publica informes temáticos, e nesses informes temáticos genera algumas recomendações aos Estados. Eu posso eh, exemplificar os dois últimos que têm muito a ver com a situação das mulheres na região, um recente informe temático sobre o eh, uso de prisão preventiva em nossos países, e aí nós sabemos que as mulheres hoje são um importante eh, contingente de, de pessoas presas em nossas cárceles, e hoje isso se vincula com a temática das drogas, e a Comissão então se realiza um conjunto de recomendações nessa matéria, e agora recentemente publicamos um outro informe temático sobre a situação das mulheres indígenas na região. Esse informe é muito recente e agora está, será formalmente lançado agora em dezembro, mas já está circulando e já está disponível incluso em nosso website. E a Comissão também convoca audiências públicas para que os atores estatais e responsáveis tenham que prestar contas à sociedade e às organizações da sociedade civil sobre determinados pontos que, que, que somos normalmente estimulados por parte das organizações a, a expressar algum tipo de opinião. Então, em todos os períodos de sessões da Comissão, sempre há, pelo menos, uma ou duas audiências públicas que se referem especificamente à temática das mulheres. A Comissão tem aprovado um novo plano estratégico. O seu plano estratégico estabelece o tema de, de direitos das mulheres, o tema de gênero como um eixo transversal principal de sua atuação no futuro. O plano aponta algumas das prioridades centrais que a Comissão identifica como desafios presentes em nossa região para os próximos cinco anos. Por exemplo, o tema da prevalência de formas de violência extrema contra as mulheres, o tema do incumprimento do dever de atuar com devida diligência por parte dos Estados, o tema do incumprimento da garantia ao acesso à justiça sem dilação, o tema de los desafios na proteção e no exercício dos direitos sexuais e reprodutivos, a triple condição de risco que sofrem as mulheres defensoras de direitos humanos, e seu trabalho como lideranças e, e das causas que perseguem, o tema dos obstáculos para o exercício dos direitos econômicos, sociais eh, e culturais das mulheres. E a partir desta, dessa identificação de principais desafios, agora nossa, eh, nossas ações estruturam suas distintas tarefas para tentar responder a, estas, a, a esses desafios. Não tenho dúvida de que um dos principais desafios também passa por essa capacidade de articulação de, em, em nível de complementaridade de ações com os demais mecanismos, se é internos à OEA, se é os mecanismos regionais, subregionais e internacionais. A Comissão expressa seu desejo e vontade de seguir atuando de maneira coordenada com todos os demais mecanismos. Muitas graças. Thank you very much, uh, Paulo, and thanks to uh, all of our uh, panelists. I'm just going to, Dubrovka will join us in a few minutes. She had to be called away, but she'll be back. I'm sure we have plenty to talk about in the meantime, and in particular, Sylvia, I just wanted to go back to, to you for a minute. In my opening comments, I mentioned that the early part of my career was spent in non-governmental organizations, and I loved every minute of that, but I moved to government because it struck me that doing important policy work had to happen there. But in doing so, I understood that I was stepping away from grassroots. I was stepping away from uh, action and engagement directly with women that were affected. And I want to go back to that a little bit. Fedede, in your comments, you mentioned that an important element of the Istanbul Convention was exactly that link between states and NGOs, the capacity to channel what the NGOs see and, and understand on the ground into the processes that states use to formulate policy. And I'm curious to know, Sylvia, how does that uh, play itself out in the context of Mesikvi? Is there a way within the hemisphere that we ensure that voices of women on the ground enter into the policy formulating process? And can Mesikvi, uh, I guess, expand on that a little bit? Sí, eh, muchas gracias. Eh, sí, en realidad, la conexión entre la convención y el movimiento de mujeres, el movimiento feminista en América Latina, comienza muy temprano, comienza en la formulación de la convención. 
O sea, fueron las mujeres feministas las que impulsaron la convención, las que trabajaron en su desarrollo y en su formulación, incluso en su contenido. Entonces yo creo que, es, que eso nace de una manera conjunta. Cuando se establece el MESEGBI se decide formar el comité de expertas. Y si bien las expertas tienen que ser designadas por los países y los países deciden cómo se llega a su designación, la mayoría de las expertas provenimos de organizaciones de mujeres, de organizaciones de la sociedad civil que hemos desarrollado investigación, que hemos hecho atención de mujeres y que hemos incluso contribuido al desarrollo de la política pública en nuestros países. Entonces, en, en el propio organismo estamos reflejando la visión de la sociedad civil. Y eso me parece que es sumamente importante. Eh, existe además un mecanismo formal de participación de la sociedad civil que consta de dos elementos. Uno es la elaboración de informes sombra. En muchos países la sociedad hace informes muy importantes. Hay organizaciones en América Latina que son continentales, el caso de CLADEM, y ellas trabajan en muchos de los países analizando la situación. Y de pronto un país presenta un informe y aparece al lado el informe de Cladem y nos dice, no, eso no es tan cierto. Entonces, cuando se hace el análisis de la información, se toma en cuenta tanto el criterio del Estado como el informe sombra que envió la sociedad civil. Y la siguiente forma, que también es parte formal del mecanismo, es que en las reuniones de, de expertas, se hace una reunión anual de expertas, y en esa reunión de expertas se abre un espacio para la participación de la sociedad civil. Entonces se invita a algunas organizaciones a presentar lo que han estado haciendo y a otras forma parte del auditorio y pueden hacer sus preguntas y presentar cosas. Pero a mí me parece que eso va más allá todavía, porque esos son los mecanismos más o menos formales que hemos establecido. Pero, por ejemplo, cuando estamos construyendo leyes modelo, se hacen consultas a la sociedad civil, se presentan las leyes a la sociedad civil, se traen las expertas de la sociedad civil y se, y se debate entre Estados y sociedad civil lo que deberíamos poner en esas leyes modelos. Entonces yo creo que ha sido un proceso que se ha, se ha ido desarrollando históricamente a lo largo de estos 13 años que tiene de existencia el mecanismo, que se ha hecho muy fluido y que ha permitido los intercambios constantes. Y me parece que sí es un proceso... Eh, que, no, que tiene la, la virtud de tener algunos aspectos formales, pero otros muy informales, que nos permiten que esa colaboración se plasme en todos los documentos que el, que el, que el MESEGBI puede, puede producir. Thank you uh, very much. I think that touches on some of what's at the root of really what we're trying to discuss here as a panel. How do we collaborate best between organizations that are all the way from the grassroots right up to the United Nations? Uh, and that whole process of, of fluid exchange, of evolution of policy, of learning and building, I think is, is really important. But you also touched on another issue that I'd like to pull out a bit and, and turn to Fedide for some comments, and that's context and credibility. So we're talking about a very diverse hemisphere, and, and Europe, uh, and interesting, I'm very interested in you mentioning that there are northern African countries that also have begun to turn their attention to the Istanbul Protocol. This, is, this issue of context and credibility becomes very important. Uh, I want to get to the piece about um, enforcement, challenges associated with enforcement when you're dealing with such a different context and so, so many, uh, I guess, layers and levels of preparedness for enforcement, capacity for enforcement, and the social context within which that happens. And I wonder if maybe you want to provide a few comments about how that issue of enforcement that you mentioned in your comments, which is so important, uh, plays itself out. How can we bolster that? And how can we do it in a context that takes note of the diversity within which the, the situation is unfolding? Feride. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is this working now? No, it's not working. What do I do? Okay, I'll just use this one. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, question. And let me say that the matter of um, enforcement is obviously, uh, it refers to the implementation by the uh, states and it's uh, getting to be owned by the, uh, the national context, so to speak. 
Now, uh, strictly speaking, from the perspective of Gravio, I would say that uh, this is really a very, Istanbul Convention is a very new instrument, and uh, we are not in a position to give a, an overall evaluation that, lasts, that takes into consideration a lot of cases. Having said that, nonetheless, I would like to uh, give some initial impressions of <laughs> what we have, and also perhaps uh, 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 support them with other information that uh, I would have. Now, uh, the first challenge, I would say, or the first uh, I, uh, step to be taken to ensure enforcement is in information dissemination. People have to know about the convention, about the standards. Istanbul Convention is quite lucky in that, ma uh, in that sense because it is really very well, quite well known in the European context. Uh, and as I have tried to indicate, uh, even countries that are bordering uh, Europe are already very interested in it because it is so well known. It touches a point that Europe has not uh, dealt with earlier. The uh, issue of violence against women was not something, it was not a specific issue that European institutions uh, concentrated on uh, 10 years ago. But, uh, so it, but it is something that hits home there too. It's obviously a problem in uh, Europe as well as anywhere else. And uh, so uh, the issue, uh, the fact that uh, Europe now has a convention specifically on violence against women, and it is such a detailed and instructive uh, instrument really, catches the attention of people uh, very much, and information dissemination therefore is uh, going very well, I think. You know, that's the first uh, challenge that needs to be overcome. The second challenge, of course, is to have legal reform, to have laws that are in line with uh, this convention. As I said, it is a criminal law convention, it is a the Human Rights Convention. I am lucky to have been part of the negotiating um, body that actually drafted the Istanbul Convention. And one of the very clear uh, striking uh, experiences there for me personally was that the moment uh, we started talking about what needs to be changed in laws regarding uh, so that we would have a proper legal attitude towards violence against women, uh, those representatives who came and I, um, from the legal profession, let's say, particularly from the criminal law profession, had a very gender neutral and therefore a, com a completely, um, uh, I would say, conservative attitude towards changing anything in national criminal laws. So to make a criminal law convention that instructs, that asks states parties to actually uh, modify their approach to the criminal law was really a, a big thing. And now we are seeing that many countries prior to ratification or immediately after ratification are actually in Europe altering their uh, criminal laws, which is a very important step towards uh, implementation. <coughs> I would also say that uh, uh, the issue I mentioned earlier, uh, the setting up of a coordinating body for, this, uh, for the Istanbul implementation of the Istanbul Convention is uh, critical. And already there is evidence from many uh, um, ratifying states that they are doing that. We are in the process of, Grave, uh, that is Gravio, are in the process of giving the right message to these countries that the, um, in, uh, the mechanism they set up as the coordinating mechanism should have the proper resources, that it should not be just there, there in name, but should really have uh, the staff and the economic, the financial resources behind it. And there are significant steps taken by many countries in that uh, area too. Last point I want to say, and that is the last but not the least, the most difficult part, of course, is to change the mindsets. And a lot of uh, the implementation, a lot of uh, actually the, 
what you've said, enforcement depends on being able to change uh, the mindsets in uh, society that are based on patriarchal attitudes and on uh, really the assumption of gender inequality more than that. And this is really a uh, challenging uh, issue. Uh, Istanbul Convention is, uh, has raised a lot of I would say eyebrows too in, uh, in some circles uh, because of its very definition of the term gender. I mean, for many of us who come from the academia or from uh, the civil society sector, from the feminist movements, I mean, the term gender is uh, such a uh, common, uh, carries a common uh, understanding. But believe you me, the term gender means a lot of different things to different people. And uh, an instrument that, uh, that defines uh, legally the term that gender is socially constructed raises questions and uh, objections from very different circles around the world, including in Europe, of course. And so uh, it's uh, challenges like these that need to be also particularly addressed in, uh, in ensuring that we change the mindsets about, uh, and that's, uh, that's taking time as anywhere else, and that's no news to anyone in this room, I'm sure, but it's uh, the most, uh, I think, uh, the crux of the matter in many ways. And to have a legally binding convention that does this, and to have a state officially committed to implement that instrument is a distinct advantage. So I think this is really uh, a positive um, point about the Istanbul Convention. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Felide. And just for the room, I'm going to ask two more questions, and then we'll open up the floor uh, for reactions and comments and hear from some of you. I wanted to build on what we have just heard about enforcement and reforms and turn to Dubrovka here for a few comments. Uh, working at the global level, this is obviously uh, that much more complicated, but in particular, laws that are gender aware as opposed to gender neutral. Uh, and I think also your comment about uh, protective postures versus enabling postures. Do we set up laws that protect women or do we set up laws that empower women? And what's the conversation at the global level that can move that forward? Dubrovka, enforcement and the global level. Thank you very much. From a global perspective, and uh, this is something that I have also presented to General Assembly recently in my report, I am seeing a huge problem with respect to implementation, enforcement. Enforcement is not yet there. So when we look at um, global instruments and regional instruments that were presented today here, um, and here I would like to mention that unfortunately CEDO convention was not uh, presented, although CEDO chairperson was uh, invited, but it was, it was already mentioned by my colleague, Ms. Feridia Char, that uh, she was in a CEDO, she is still in the CEDO committee and I was CEDO committee for 12 years. So we have to see uh, that CEDO committee is examining countries for all, from all parts of the world. 189 states and when I was for 12 years in the CEDO committee I have um, had opportunity to participate in uh, um, monitoring of uh, states from this region but also African region, Asian region, European region and now when I'm looking at this time from this perspective as a special rapporteur on violence against women uh, and I'm entrusted also to use regional mechanisms in my work. Now I'm trying to combine CEDO convention with Belém do Pará convention when I'm visiting states from this region. I have had a visit to Argentina and I was really looking into all possible uh, recommendations that are already out because now we have to be cautious. When I am putting forward recommendations, it is important to put credible recommendations that are using what is already the out, what was produced by relevant regional mechanisms. And the same goes for African countries and European countries. So now the main idea is that we need to have 
credible, good recommendations. This is the first step. And we are not yet there because there are some differences, even at the global level. I'm seeing differences between recommendations coming from special procedures like my mandate, special report on violence against women, maybe some colleagues that are also special procedures, and some treaty bodies. And for example, for Argentina, on specific concern, you can see not, not not a big difference, but there are differences with respect to recommendations that are uh, then um, produced by different bodies. And we have to see at the first level how to produce credible recommendations that are covering global and regional instruments, how to use CEDO and Belem do Para or other regional instruments when relevant jointly, and then to set recommendation that is really something that should be acted upon. Then the next stage is implementation. And here on implementation side, it is really important to recognize that it is obligation of a state to prevent violence against women, to uh, prosecute perpetrators, to provide services. And at this level, it would be important to have all stakeholders to join in, including donors, including uh, non-governmental organizations, but the main responsibility is on states. And this um, huge gap between uh, norms and their implementation is something that should be addressed. Uh, this initiative to have better cooperation between global and regional mechanisms is going in that direction, because I hope that uh, in the next few years we are going to be able to show concrete results. Recently I was in El Salvador and I was attending a conference on femicides and uh, let me also mention that my mandate is uh, now pushing a global initiative related to uh, prevention of femicide or establishment of a femicide watch or femicide observatory in all countries all over the world. An example from Latin American countries and model law on femicide is extremely important but we are not yet at the level of having comparable data. We do not know how to compare data collected by different countries because they are collected in different manner. So I hope that in the future we will have comparable data and then focus on cases, their analysis and prevention of such uh, horrible uh, gender-related killings of women. So this is initiative that is uh, extremely important and uh, that, that is showing the value of uh, comparable results that, would, that could go in direction of real implementation. So we have to find implementation mechanisms. We have to have good practices. And this exchange between different uh, models that we have at regional level is going in the direction of really showing what is working, what is not working. I have mentioned El Salvador in order to just uh, state that I was uh, shocked by the situation of women in prison there in connection with uh, abortions. And I was really surprised because I knew the situation. I was reading documents, but when you read documents, you are really not aware that women are in prison, even in a situation of uh, miscarriage, when they are accused of homicide, they go to prison for 20 years. And this is something that we need to find a way how to work together, how to send a message from global level and from regional level that this is not in line with CEDA Convention, all other global instruments, but also regional instruments, that there are mechanisms that are addressing this issue and then to see how to achieve this change, how to do it. So maybe states that are able to support uh, this level of change could also um, act upon this initiative and we all have to find a way how to really go from, uh, from agendas, from instruments and monitoring results to concrete results at, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the level of each and every individual. And what I really like in Belem the Para Convention is this um, part of the convention, this article that is stating the uh, right of every woman to life free from violence. And now I am using this sentence from Belem do Para, this paragraph, and I'm trying to say that this is at the global level something that is accepted standard because we have to pull from regional to global, from global to regional, and to send a message that all those agenda are now joining together, to send a clear message that violence is preventable, violence against women is gender-based violence, and we need all parts of societies to come together and to stop violence against women. Thank you. Thank you, Dobroka. 
Well, that's a really great segue into the last question I wanted to ask. It's quite a coincidence, uh, and maybe not such a coincidence. Um, so we've talked about uh, mechanisms for change. We've talked about the importance of data and information and the exchange of information between organizations that, that address these issues. And everyone keeps coming around to sharing information and the issue of culture change. I mentioned in my opening comments that I've been doing this for a long time now. We have something we didn't have when I started to do this, and that is information technology. We have the ability to reach millions and millions of people with high-level messages, with things that really matter to them very quickly and in a lot of ways. Social media has an impact on this problem. I think we've all seen over the last several weeks the Me Too hashtag. And I think many of us in this room have even perhaps engaged in that conversation. I know I have. I know we all have our own stories. And the last question I want to ask and the last, I guess, uh, sort of channel of conversation I'd like to open up before opening the floor to the room is how can we use uh, these new technologies? How can we use social media? An important mandate for the Inter-American Human Rights Commission is prevention and dissemination of information. So I wanted to turn it over to Paolo for a few words about how do we use new technologies and how do we advance a useful, effective, concrete conversation that will change minds, change cultures, and help us to create these connections between the institutions and tools that we have at global and regional levels. Paolo. Graças, embaixadora. Eu não tenho dúvida de que hoje o uso das tecnologias da informação são são estratégicas, especialmente para a promoção dos direitos humanos. Obviamente que nós só podemos fazer isso em duas esferas. Uma que tem que ver con el uso de las tecnologías para mejorar la difusión de nuestro propio trabajo e empoderar las organizaciones de la sociedad civil en sus acciones internas a partir de, de la fundamentación de sus iniciativas de articulación local eh, amparadas en discursos que estén eh, multiplicados por los organismos internacionales y respaldados por los organismos internacionales. Una otra, una otra dimensión tiene que ver con, con el carácter promocional. O sea, creo que las organizaciones pueden y deben ser un poco más proactivas en la difusión de determinados principios por medio de las redes sociales, que son un espacio donde se generan opiniones muy libres, obviamente por su naturaleza, y que es un, un ambiente de disputa cultural permanente, ¿no? donde se, se, se materializan concepciones. Hoy, vamos a hablar abiertamente, ¿eh? hoy hay una repercusión muy fuerte sobre la, la, la categoría de la crítica a la supuesta ideología de género. Los países en la región cada vez más están respondiendo a esa falsa eh, categoría, eh, construyendo legislaciones para supuestamente eh, corresponder a la opinión de las mayorías instaladas conjunturalmente en esa materia. O sea, los organismos internacionales, cuando utilizan las redes sociales también para expresar sus opiniones y rechazar de manera contundente ese tipo de práctica, ayuda a empoderar las organizaciones de la sociedad civil internamente dentro de los estados que están sufriendo una, un, un conjunto, un, un, una situación de hostigamiento muy fuerte ¿no? en, en las simples... Eh, en el simples mantenimiento de principios que ya son consagrados en todos los, los tratados, convenciones, o sea, creo que el uso de, lo, de, la, de la tecnología, de la información o de los medios sociales para la promoción de los derechos humanos, entonces tiene esa doble función, no apenas de promocionar el avance de nuevos estándares o de nuevas recomendaciones, pero también para ayudar en la lucha contra retrocesos culturales que, que cada vez más son muy presentes, especialmente en nuestra región. Okay, thank you, Paolo. Uh, I think we've had a really good round of, of initial engagement, and I'd like now to open the floor uh, to the audience to see are there any questions or comments. And I would ask you please to introduce yourself, say your name and the organization that you're with, if that's the case. Please, the floor is open. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Sasa Tong. I am a student at American University. Um, my question has to do with sexual harassment in public spaces. So when I'm doing research, I see that the one mechanism I see internationally is the UN Safe City, which addresses public spaces. But most of the sexual harassment work is about in workplace. So I was just wondering, in regionally, have you seen any 
initiatives to address this. And number two is I only see stuff in the civil society realm. I feel like there's not a lot of connection between civil society initiatives to policy. So can you also comment on that, please? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think we'll take them uh, one at a time for now. We have some time. So, Felite? Can I go? Yes, please. Well, I'd just like to say that in, uh, in response to this particular question, I have good news from the Istanbul Convention side because sexual harassment uh, is taken with a broad sc scope in uh, the Istanbul Convention. It, it is not understood uh, as limited to the workplace. In many countries we know, for instance, the sexual harassment is uh, dealt with under labor law and uh, because it's sexual harassment in the workplace. That is basically what is uh, what it considers. Now, uh, it, sexual harassment in the public sphere, as you call it, but that includes the school, the um, uh, education environment, the, on the street, uh, the health environment, all these other issues, uh, all these other uh, venues uh, is also a fact and including sexual harassment in the, uh, on the internet, sexual uh, harassment online. So the Istanbul Convention's uh, demand, I would say, from the state parties is that they criminalize sexual uh, harassment in all spheres and make it a criminal offense. And so that is, a, an, I suppose, an answer in the positive direction to the question that you asked uh, for, for ratifiers of this convention. Thanks, Faridé. Celia. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes? Okay. In the Convention de Brendo Pará, the hostigamiento sexual is prevista specifically for the place of work, the place of study, and also the services of health. No obstante, al estar comprendida en la convención cualquier forma de violencia contra las mujeres que se realice en el ámbito público, también estamos empezando a, re a encontrar muchísimo de acoso sexual callejero. O sea, la mayoría de nuestros países tienen normas para el hostigamiento sexual cuando sucede en el trabajo o en, o en la educación. Menos lo contienen para los servicios de salud. Pero sí... Este, se están empezando a incluir algunas leyes para el hostigamiento sexual callejero y estamos empezando también, y también los indicadores que tenemos para los países hace que tengan que responder cuál es su legislación. Algunos países tienen leyes penales y otros países tienen leyes administrativas. Y algunas funcionan mejor en algunos aspectos, o sea, las leyes penales tienen una sanción más fuerte, pero también es más difícil que las personas denuncien porque son procesos más complicados. Las leyes administrativas tienen la facilidad de la prueba y además eh, la facilidad de la denuncia, pero el obstáculo de que si la persona se va del lugar de trabajo o de estudio ya no la podemos sancionar. Entonces, ese es un debate que tenemos en los países y estamos buscando la mejor forma para eh, poder eh, disminuir el hostigamiento sexual, ya sea en la calle o en el lugar de trabajo. Gracias. Thanks, Sylvia. I'm going to ask Dubrok to comment on the second part of your question, which I think had to do with the connection between civil society and policy. Thank you. Let me just add that sexual harassment is also covered by CEDAW Convention, and there are numerous recommendations that are addressing sexual harassment at uh, state level. Um, with respect to um, civil society and their uh, role in influencing policy. Here I would like to mention my experience from Argentina and New Namenos movement that truly really moved the government in a right direction. So we have to see how to um, connect better, bet, better those um, policies between NGOs and uh, different movements like New Namenos and uh, governmental policies. And I would like to suggest that uh, non-governmental organizations as important players in this field should use those instruments that are, that, that are at their disposal. For example, my, my mandate has uh, 
communication procedure that could be complained, that could be sent with respect to different uh, types of violence against women. And I have possibility to uh, then question the government how they are dealing with specific case of violence. So I think the role of non-governmental organizations is extremely important. And now with new technologies, with internet, all those movements are having new possibilities. As a special reporter, I have decided also to focus on online violence against women because we are seeing that new technologies are now uh, used by some in order to um, inflict violence against women by use of those technologies. So now we can speak about uh, um, online violence, cyber violence, there are different terms used because we have to see new challenges. It is, it is extremely important to see how to apply current uh, laws that we have at the national and global level with respect to those new technologies that are enabling different facilitated forms of gender-based violence against women that, that were not possible before. Now some new forms are out and we have to see if current laws are fully applicable, criminal laws, this uh, issue of uh, sexual harassment, if you transmit this to level of internet and possibility to have reach throughout the world that, that those images could not be could not be deleted, that there should be maybe right of, the, of such victims to erase those, um, those uh, violent um, posts that are out. So there are challenges that should be addressed. And um, just to, to go back to your original question, non-governmental organizations are extremely important. Uh, they should uh, be encouraged to play a uh, more, uh, more visible role because governments are sometimes reluctant. Sometimes governments are not uh, willing to fully cooperate. And we are seeing some retrogressions in different parts of the world in which governments are trying to restrict non-governmental organizations by new laws that are imposing um, uh, strict uh, control of uh, use of funds and so on. I think that we have to uh, confront this with, uh, with uh, clear knowledge that without work of non-governmental organizations, we are really not able to progress with uh, concrete uh, activities at, at uh, level of services and promotion of all those policies that we would like to have at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, please. Yes. Thank you very much. My name is Tarub Faramand. I'm the president of an organization called WhyHer. And we focus on gender integration, mainstreaming, human trafficking prevention, and uh, gender-based violence prevention and, and response. Thank you so much. It's so lovely to be in an environment where everybody's friendly, because we're usually faced with pushback when we talk about uh, violence against women and gender-based violence. I have one comment and one question. My comment is related to uh, the information. You mentioned that it's important to get information, but the reporting is, is critical. Because women, in general, act, in some cultures, accept violence as part of life. And the way uh, violence against women is reported is, is critical. In some cultures, women are killed uh, under the umbrella of honor killing when they are actually killed because they, they want to deny them inheritance, for example. So that's my first question, my first comment. My second um, is basically related to sensitization of program managers and, and, and the program implementers. It is so critical from my experience to sensitize program managers on how to address gender and gender-based violence as part of the program, whether it's health education, rule of law, or even energy, because that's what we have been focusing on, and we achieved incredible results when we sensitized them. And finally, I want to hear your thoughts about violence against women approaches for women who are subjected to uh, migration and internally displaced uh, uh, women, basically, in, in result, as a result of political oppression or also uh, disasters, natural disasters, as we are seeing now in Latin America and in Europe. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. It's a, a broad range of issues uh, to touch on. And I'm going to ask our panelists to be a little bit disciplined in their responses because we have quite a long line and I'd like to make sure that everyone is heard from. So quickly I'm going to turn to Paolo, uh, who may want to address the issue of migration and displaced women. I understand that's an issue for the Commission. Well, the Commission has published a few years um informe temático sobre mobilidade humana. E aí há um, um, um enfoque muito importante dentro do informe que tem a ver com as mulheres migrantes e as situações de vulnerabilidade para, para eventuais situações de trata de pessoas. Seja, a Comissão estabelece algumas, algumas recomendações para que os Estados realizem eh, políticas públicas e políticas migratórias com atenção à particularidade da situação de las mujeres muy especialmente y hay que recordar que la propia corte interamericana recientemente ha, ha decidido sobre una opinión consultiva que tenía que ver con la situación de niños y niñas migrantes y ahí también hay una énfasis importante sobre el tema de, la, de las mujeres ¿no? lo que me llama la atención hoy para, para comentar un aspecto que me parece muy actual es eh, el riesgo que se tiene em se si tentar mesclar a discussão que tem a ver com, la, com o enfrentamento à trata de pessoas com o direito à migração, especialmente o direito à migração das mulheres ou dos meninos que estão desacompanhados. Então, vocês têm que cuidar muito eh, em relação a saber separar bem os conceitos, o que estão presentes na Convenção de Palermo, que caracterizam bem o que é uma situação de trata de pessoas, com as tentativas de criminalização do direito à migração, que se não há um fim de exploração específica, não se configura a, a trata de pessoas. E isso tem a ver muito especialmente com a situação das mulheres. Então, creio que nós, como comissão, especialmente, temos que profundizar melhor a discussão conceptual desses dois temas, e porque não há em direitos humanos Uh, a oposição entre direitos, não? Ou, se, ou, se, ou há um respeito amplo a, la, a todas as situações de proteção dos direitos humanos, ou não estamos falando de políticas com enfoque em direitos humanos. Então, esse é meu comentário específico. Thank you, Paulo. Felipe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd also like to say a few words about training, but mostly uh, respond to the part regarding the displaced uh, women. Now, uh, about training, obviously, uh, reporting and training are very important, as was uh, suggested in the question. And in many countries, we are facing, in general, uh, that there is a lack of reporting. But that lack of reporting is also related to, is related to lack of awareness on the part of women, it's related to the social conditions that, that surround that women, but it is also related to the lack of adequate training of the people who are supposed to receive the complaints or who are supposed to deal with these complaints. So um, the, an important part of the first P of fighting with uh, violence against women, that is prevention, and also uh, protection, of course, has to do with training of the officials, and that needs to be, uh, and uh, training of those who come into contact. Now, coming to the, uh, the, the women who are displaced and their plight, this, of course, is a particularly aggravated area where violence against women is uh, a problem. It is also connected very uh, closely with the lack of training there, with the, of, of the border officials, of those who deal with uh, the refugees and with asylum seekers and all that. Generally speaking, uh, the Istanbul Convention, first of all, is, uh, has a, uh, a special part that deals with uh, violence against women in the case of refugee and asylum seeking women. And it asks the countries, first of all, to recognize violence against women as a form of persecution in asking for refugee status by the asylum seekers. So an asylum seeker that uh, claims she has been subjected to violence against uh, herself in her place of um, 
origin, where she originated, or on the way uh, in the process, uh, should, be, should, should have the right circumstances to report this uh, and should have a, a, a group of people there who are willing to listen to this and who understand this plight, who uh, also provide her with the opportunity to uh, give this information in confidence, if possible, in, uh, or in, uh, favor, uh, in uh, good circumstances as far as the uh, person is concerned. A second area is that these people need to be protected because they're especially vulnerable en route during the time they are in the asylum center, asylum seeking centers or in the uh, first instance places where they are vulnerable to uh, violence against them, sexual harassment, sexual uh, rape, whatever, uh, particularly. This is an, another uh, area of training that, uh, that needs uh, to be emphasized and the state's responsibility for this is, uh, should be underlined. And, um, of course, a third and most important area is migrant women, women who are uh, already living in a country in the situation of uh, migrant women or refugee women whose residence in that country depends on their partners. This happens many times. And the partners, if the partner is violent, then there is very little uh, uh, opportunity for that woman to report the violence for fear that she will be deported, that she will lose her uh, residence status. So uh, the Istanbul Convention uh, obligates uh, countries, uh, states, to do away with this kind of legislation uh, so that women who are faced with violence against them, women, migrant women, uh, should be accorded uh, independent residence permits uh, uh, in order to allow them to benefit benefit from the rule of law mechanisms or whatever that is available in that society where they have come. So, thank you. Thanks very much. Silvia indicated she wanted to comment as well. Rapidamente para dejar espacio. Eh, yo creo que siempre que trabajamos en violencia contra las mujeres y hablamos en espacios públicos nos enfrentamos a que nos ataquen. Porque socialmente, o sea, la, la, la ideología preponderante socialmente considera que las mujeres debemos estar en una posición de subordinación y que la violencia contra las mujeres no existe, sino que es algo natural en la sociedad. Entonces, cuando destapamos una cosa así, siempre nos enfrentamos a reacciones muy fuertes. Eso para decírtelo en lo personal. Ahora, yendo, la violencia contra las mujeres, si bien todas las mujeres estamos sujetas a ella, hay condiciones que se intersectan que hacen que las mujeres sean más vulnerables. Entonces, la migración es una de ellas, los desastres son otras. Siempre que nos encontramos frente a, a situaciones de crisis donde los ordenamientos este, legales pierden vigencia prácticamente, ¿verdad? O sea, pienso en situaciones terribles como fue el terremoto en Haití. En esos casos eh, se desata, digamos, una especie de ley de la selva donde las mujeres se transforman, al igual que en la guerra, en territorios en territorios para ser invadidos por algunos hombres. Y eso a veces ni siquiera se puede solucionar desde las convenciones. Eso requiere una acción inmediata en lo local y requiere además que quienes están eh, cumpliendo funciones de, de ayuda o de mantener el orden en esas situaciones hayan recibido un entrenamiento especial y sean seleccionados con mucho cuidado porque a veces los cuerpos que se envían para cubrir esos desastres son los que terminan ejerciendo violencia contra las mujeres. En cuanto a la migración en América Latina sabemos muy bien que las mujeres que hacen su trayecto desde Sudamérica hasta Estados Unidos saben que en algún momento de su viaje van a ser violadas y que por eso muchas veces empiezan a tomar anticonceptivos antes de empezar el viaje. Y eso es una realidad terrible. Tenemos que pensar en las condiciones de miseria que viven las mujeres en sus países para arriesgarse a, a hacer una travesía de este tipo. Yo creo que eso requiere de una acción muy integral que también lleve a la mejoría de las situaciones económicas y sociales en las cuales viven las mujeres en cada uno de nuestros países, que no lo vamos a alcanzar solamente con, eh, en, con entrenamiento de los oficiales de fronteras. Es mucho más profundo el problema, es un problema que tiene raíces estructurales que deben ser atacadas muy cuidadosamente.
Gracias. Thanks, Sylvia. Next question, please. Good morning. Thank you for the work you do and for all the comments um, this morning. My name is Catherine Conway, and I am a representative of the National Democratic Institute. And we do a lot of thinking about women's political participation and how it can be a tool that will change societies, change how governments work, and eventually um, change how laws are implemented such that they take gender equality into consideration. Um, I have a question about in thinking about behavior change. Um, Gender equality is one of the stickiest values, it seems like. It's hard to change at, within public spaces and private spaces. We currently are working in Nicaragua on a campaign um, that looks at teenage pregnancy. We found teenage pregnancy to be the greatest barrier to women entering the political realm as it takes away socioeconomic opportunities, education, starting at a very young age. Um, and we also, in Nicaragua, see one of the highest rates of domestic violence throughout the region. And this is coupled with a closing society. Um, Nicaragua held a municipal election on Sunday, which was represented further backsliding um, in the political sphere. And so my question is, do we consider the use of these conventions, these tools, as um, sticks, where we're going to punish um, people who don't comply with them? Or do we consider them as carrots, where we're going to incentivize leaders and societies to move in a certain direction? And how do we consider that in a society where the space is closing um, for NGOs um, and for civil society, local organizations? And how do we sort of think through the best process to change behaviors when, we, when the government starts to close and when there's no space for civil society? OK, thank you. That's a challenging question and extremely interesting. Uh, Dubravka, would you like to? Thank you. Thank you for this question. Um, question related to political participation of women is extremely relevant because through concrete numbers, we are seeing where we are. And uh, current numbers are only 22% average. And we are progressing very, very slowly. And even when we do have countries with 50% of women in the parliament, we still have discriminatory laws and laws that are not properly addressing women's rights. So we really need to see how to uh, proceed with standards that we already have with uh, respect to political participation of women. And here, I would like to recognize the value of global instruments, CEDAW Convention. Uh, here we have mentioned two regional instruments, Belém do Pará and Istanbul Convention, that are focusing on violence against women. CEDAW Convention is providing a broader framework because CEDAW is focusing on all forms of discrimination against women and violence against women as a form of discrimination. So CEDAW is providing a broader framework that is clearly connecting violence against women with all other forms of discrimination against women that are uh, enabling that violence that we are seeing in private and public sphere. So we have to see that prevention of violence against women could be done only if we really focus on prevention of other forms of discrimination. So we have to tackle political participation of women in the same time as we are tackling services for victims of violence, uh, changes of attitudes. All those measures should be done in parallel, in holistic manner. And it is really important then to see how to use all those global instruments that are already there, that are covering all areas, and focus then on the concrete uh, problem that is, uh, that is actual at the national level. So I think that the question was extremely important, and I hope that I have partially answered, because it, it's really a very broad question, so my colleagues could maybe supplement. Thanks, Dubrovka. Uh, interesting, is it a shield or is it a sword? And, and I'm going to turn the floor over to Sylvia to comment. Sí. Um, desde, desde el NSEGBI, hemos estado trabajando en una ley modelo sobre violencia política contra las mujeres. Y eh, hemos enfrentado varios desafíos. Uno de los desafíos es concept conceptualizar qué es, perdón, qué es la violencia política, se, se oye todavía, ¿Qué es la violencia política contra las mujeres? O sea, partimos de una definición amplia del espectro que debería cumplir esa ley de acuerdo con la recomendación 23 de la CEDAW. 
porque cuando hablamos de participación política no solo me estoy refiriendo a aquellas mujeres que han decidido ser políticas, sino que también me estoy refiriendo al derecho a las mujeres a ejercer el voto. Me estoy refiriendo a las mujeres que participan en sindicatos, las mujeres que participan en organizaciones sociales y también a las defensoras de derechos de las mujeres. Entonces, si partimos de ese concepto amplio, sí podemos hablar de, de violencia política contra las mujeres. Las primeras veces que a mí me mostraron proyectos de ley de violencia política contra las mujeres era como establecer pol, eh, privilegios para las mujeres que participan en partidos políticos. Y eso no me parece adecuado, me parece que tenemos que tener una concepción más amplia. Dicho esto... Si queremos lograr la paridad en la participación política, y ahora sí estoy hablando de mujeres que participan en partidos, tenemos que atacar la violencia que se ejerce contra esas mujeres políticas. Porque mal puede una mujer participar si alrededor de ella, en su propio partido, la están agrediendo. Si está recibiendo amenazas, hay mujeres a las que le dicen, bueno, como tenemos que cumplir con una ley de paridad, la vamos a poner en tal puesto para que usted salga electa. Pero cuando usted salga electa va a tener que renunciar para que tal otra persona, que es un hombre, ocupe su lugar. Entonces, ese tipo de mecanismos que están operando en la región y que hemos enfrentado cosas terribles que han terminado hasta en muerte de mujeres como en Bolivia, han llevado a que tengamos una eh, preocupación especial por ofrecer una ley modelo que ponemos a disposición de todos los mecanismos para que la puedan revisar porque creemos que puede ser una contribución importante, ¿verdad? Porque es una ley que está contemplando todos estos aspectos, pero que además está proponiendo sanciones, o sea, está en diferentes niveles, o sea, sanciones leves, sanciones graves y sanciones muy graves, según lo que acontece. Y que estamos considerando que esa violencia política se puede ejercer, ya sea de, en lo interpersonal, por el compañero, el esposo de la señora, pero también en lo, en, en lo público, tanto a nivel nacional como a nivel local, que es donde más se manifiesta, y también desde el Estado. Y por eso se establecen obligaciones para los partidos políticos, para el Estado, para los mecanismos para el avance de la mujer, e incluso este, para los organismos electorales de los países. Muchas gracias. Yes, thank you very, very much for this uh, very informative and helpful panel. I so much appreciate the intersection taken here with all the different mechanisms. My name is Stephanie Ordaleva, and I'm the founding president and legal director for Women Enabled International. We are an NGO that works globally at the intersection of women's rights and disability rights to advance the rights of women and girls with disabilities in collaboration with global partners around the world. Um, my question to all of you, and I guess first my statement, as I hope most of you know, uh, disabled women and girls are about one-fifth of the world's population of women and girls. And also disabled women and girls of all ages experience gender-based and sexual violence at somewhere between two and four times that experienced by other women and girls. Unfortunately, statistics are not segregated around the world, so the information is a bit um, hazy. I do appreciate the fact that the, the prior Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, Rashida Manju, did do a report on gender-based violence and women and girls with disabilities. Um, but I would uh, like to know how all of you are integrating one-fifth of the world's women and girls into the work that you do. I know that most of these, all of these um, regions and the global mechanisms, of course, have uh, both conventions that protect the rights of women and girls with disabilities and specifically with respect to gender-based violence. The Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, for example, addresses this, but um, it's also addressed, I believe, in the Istanbul Convention and, and of course, in the uh, Inter-American System as well. So if you would all just uh, talk to me briefly about how you're integrating women and girls with disabilities into your work on gender-based violence. Thank you very much. 
Thanks very much for the question. And I am going to ask uh, Paolo Abrao to lead off on that, given the convention of the, in the Inter-American System on the Rights of Disabled People and the decade that we're also currently experiencing. Paolo. También. Bueno, eso me genera la oportunidad para, para anunciar que la Comisión Interamericana ha decidido crear una nueva unidad temática, una unidad temática sobre personas con discapacidad, Obviamente que ejemplo de todas las otras unidades temáticas de la Comisión, que son 12, también va a trabajar con la transversalidad del tema de género. Y ahora nosotros vamos a realizar una, una consulta pública junto a la sociedad civil para construir la primera agenda de trabajo de esta nueva unidad de protección a las personas con discapacidad. Y creo que será una, una importante oportunidad de eh, tener la, la participación de las organizaciones de la sociedad civil que transversalizan los temas eh, de defensa de los derechos de las mujeres para eh, contaminar positivamente la agenda de esta nueva unidad y trabajar en ese sentido. Entonces, es algo que está en marcha, Tenemos una, fue una decisión muy reciente, hasta el fin del año vamos a trabajar para construir esa agenda y a partir del año que viene eh, tener una relatora o un relator asignado especialmente para esa tarea, aprovechando la, la buena fotografía que vamos a tener a partir de enero, donde la mayoría de las comisionadas, de la, de la composición de la comisión será de mujeres, ¿no? con cuatro mujeres y tres hombres. Thanks, Pablo. Tu broca. Thank you. Thank you very much for your important question and comment. And I'm very glad that you have mentioned my predecessor, Ms. Rashida Manju, and her report that is still relevant. I would also like to mention uh, other special reporters that are dealing with uh, uh, violence against women and persons with disabilities. It is special reporter on persons with disabilities. That is uh, Christina Aguilera. And uh, my mandate is cooperating with her on uh, different uh, uh, concerns related to different forms of violence against women that you have rightfully pointed out is uh, a huge concern. Whenever my mandate is visiting country, I am meeting with uh, non-governmental organizations that are also presenting persons with women with disabilities and different problems at uh, national level in different uh, uh, circumstances. Um, when I am producing those reports, I'm trying to uh, reflect on their situation and to use global instruments. Um, Convention, CEDAW Convention, but also Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities and also regional instruments if they are relevant and have uh, specific uh, um, uh, points that should be used. So I think that at this uh, global stage of knowledge, we have to be really um, inclusive and we have to point on all those concerns that were not properly resolved. And um, in cases of uh, women with disabilities, that there are many issues that are uh, pending, that are not properly addressed at the national level. So I think that through all of us as mechanisms, uh, be it special reporters or treaty bodies, is really to point out on concrete problems and concrete recommendations with respect to uh, challenges in front. Thank you. Thanks to Broca Ferry Day, I think also wanted to comment. Thank you very much. I just wanted to first of all say that the name Stefani Ortelewa is a very familiar to me as a long time member of uh, the CEDAW committee and now of the, uh, of the Grebio. So I'm very glad to be able to put a, na a face to the uh, name too. I'm aware of the wonderful work that you are always doing and uh, in uh, providing information for the uh, for the bodies, mechanisms like CEDAW and uh, the Istanbul Convention now. And uh, that is really much appreciated. Uh, uh, in terms of, I mean, uh, um, Dubravka has already touched on what CEDAW does, but with regard to the Istanbul Convention, I can also tell you that obviously the Istanbul Convention addresses the issue and through, uh, in our monitoring exercises, we do uh, ask questions and receive reports from uh, uh, NGOs on the conditions of uh, disabled women vis-a-vis -vis 
violence against uh, them in that particular country. It is, as I keep saying, too early to give a general uh, output about this from Gravio experience, but uh, rest assured that it is uh, uh, taken up during the monitoring of the Istanbul uh, Convention. But while I have the floor, can I just add one sentence to a previous question that I didn't have a chance to comment on? There was a question about whether these conventions should be used as sticks or um, carrots, so, so to speak. Obviously, they should be used as both. And, more, and for more purposes. They should be used as sticks and uh, carrots, but also mainly, I think the basic function of these conventions is that they are teaching tools. They are, uh, and they provide a genuine learning experience for different levels of society, both for the government and for uh, the civil society and uh, for uh, everyone living there. So we should never uh, forget their powerful um, uh, impact in changing the minds. Uh, that is something I wanted to say. And with regards to the closing of the uh, space for civil societies in many uh, countries, this of course is, uh, is very relevant. And my advice or the way I look at these things is that, well, yes, things are getting difficult for, uh, uh, for uh, the kinds of causes that we are dis uh, discussing here all around the world, but we should, call, uh, we should go on with the work. And uh, one thing that can be done is we may, uh, I think, groups or NGOs, civil society sections working for women's rights should not be, um, uh, should not be timid about making alliances with other groups who are uh, also working uh, for similar causes and if there are cross-cutting uh, cross points, we should look at where these cross-cutting points are and make uh, conjectural alliances for that reason. I won't elaborate anymore. Thanks, Felide. Next question. Thank you. Thank you for hosting the event today and for your work, as well as to the members of the audience who have asked some really uh, insightful questions. Uh, my name is Gabrielle Barral. I'm the Senior Gender Specialist with the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, IFAS. Uh, I also work on building women's leadership and political participation. And my question goes back to this uh, issue of violence and harassment of women in the political space. Um, Madame Mesa, you already spoke uh, to the challenges of uh, arriving at the, the model legislation that has been produced and, and the, the agreement here, and I appreciate that it was a, it was a great accomplishment. Mm -hmm. My question regards the next steps. Um, what change uh, do you see on the horizon resulting from this? What are some of the, um, the success stories or the breakthroughs in the region within this area? And also, what are some of the challenges? Uh, you've talked about implementation as well. Are there specific examples of that that you can um, highlight for us? Thank you. Thanks for that question. I really appreciate, in particular, the focus on success stories. Uh, we are making progress. Um, we've come a long way, and I want to congratulate everyone on the panel today for being part of that. And uh, having given you all a moment to think about your answer, I'm going to turn the floor over to Sylvia first. I'm sorry, I didn't catch exactly the question. Oh, so I think we had a question from the floor about what are some of the most important breakthroughs in the hemisphere, what are some success stories, and what are the biggest challenges that women still face, mostly in regard to political uh, engagement. Okay, maybe what we'll do is we'll find I, a way to get a translation. I'm sorry, I've got tired. I, 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 need, I, need, I need this. So what we'll do then is I'll turn the floor is, is over to, to Paolo, to and then Sylvia will give you a chance uh, to think about it, and we'll come back to you. Paolo, did you want to go ahead? Sylvia, um desafio que me parece relevante é como ampliar a participação política da mulher mais allá de los espacios electorales, pero también dentro de los espacios de formulación y creación de las políticas públicas estatales. Nosotros sabemos que muchas de las prioridades de un determinado Estado y de un determinado gobierno se establecen en el marco de la formulación de las políticas públicas en todo su ciclo, desde la identificación y asignación de presupuesto, desde la formulación de la política pública y después del monitoreo y seguimiento de la implementación de, la, de las políticas públicas. 
Entonces, abrir canales de participación social y participación política de las mujeres eh, en el proceso de construcción de las políticas públicas es, es una fórmula privilegiada para disputar desde adentro esa institucionalidad que tradicionalmente es una institucionalidad que no responde a las necesidades o al enfoque de género o a la perspectiva de las mujeres. Los espacios son muy ocupados eh, hegemónicamente por los hombres, con una cabeza totalmente machista en el ejercicio del poder, y, y la diferencia en la vida de las personas, en la protección de los derechos de las personas, van, van a producirse por medio del ejercicio de la oferta de los servicios que son disponibles a la población, a los cuales buena parte de, la, de, 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 nuestros, de las víctimas o de las personas que buscan por derechos van a depender de esas políticas para efectivamente producir un mínimo de respeto a sus derechos. Entonces, pensar más allá de fórmulas de garantizar la presencia de la mujer en las esferas electorales de la, grande, de la política eh, electoral, pensar también como, eh, como cada vez más involucrar la participación de la mujer en los procesos de formulación de las políticas públicas, yo creo que es importante. No solo las políticas sobre mujeres, pero las políticas públicas en general dentro de los países. Esa conexión entre las, los mecanismos de participación social con enfoque de género en el proceso mismo de la definición de las prioridades eh, gubernamentales del país. Puede ser algo efectivamente transformador. Algunos países, por ejemplo, Brasil, hay una experiencia de la Conferencia Nacional de Mujeres, que, que es un evento que, que ocurre todos los años, que no, no apenas eh, eh, garantiza la presencia de la mujer en la definición de las propias políticas sobre género y de protección de las mujeres, pero también prevé la posibilidad de, eh, de, una, de una manera proactiva interceder e involucrarse en, en los destinos de determinadas prioridades presupuestarias. Y, y creo que eso es fundamental hoy, porque a veces eh, el poder simbólico es muy importante, no tengo ninguna duda en relación a eso, pero también hay que disputar efectivamente para dónde van los presupuestos públicos, cómo ellos están siendo gastos y cómo eh, permitir un, un enfoque de, eh, de protección de las mujeres de manera transversal en todas las políticas públicas puede tener un carácter muy efectivo en la protección de los derechos también. Thanks, Paolo. I'd like to briefly apologize to Sylvia and to others who may be having some difficulty with the interpretation, but I think we're ready to punt the question you. back to you, Sylvia. Uh, sí, six gracias. Six. Me disculpo, pero me cansé y dejé de entender el inglés. <laughs> <laughs> eh, yo creo que en América Latina hemos tenido avances importantes. La mayoría de los países para la participación de las políticas tienen sistemas de cuotas. Eh, en materia de violencia política, los avances son lentos, pero ahí vamos. O sea, Bolivia cuenta con una ley contra la violencia y el acoso político contra las mujeres. México tiene un protocolo también. Otros países han incluido la violencia política contra las mujeres en eh, sus leyes generales de violencia contra las mujeres. El caso de Argentina, por ejemplo. Desafíos. Desafíos son muchos. El gran desafío es la paridad. No hemos logrado la paridad, yo creo que en ninguno de nuestros países, ni en los del norte ni en los del sur. O sea, algunos países, por ejemplo, en el caso de Costa Rica, se aprueba una ley que dice, una ley electoral que establece, electoral que establece la paridad y la alternabilidad. ¿Y qué nos pasa? Que cuando vamos a elegir los diputados, o sea, como se eligen provincialmente, los partidos lo que hacen es poner encabezando en cada, en cada provincia un hombre. O sea, cumplen con la paridad, pero no con la paridad horizontal. En la vertical ponen mujeres de segundas, pero hay muchos partidos muy pequeños que tienen un solo diputado y esos son todos hombres. Entonces, cuando pasamos de las cuotas a la paridad, bajamos la representación de las mujeres. Entonces, uno de los grandes desafíos es encontrar sistemas efectivos que hagan posible la participación paritaria de las mujeres. Y el siguiente desafío es, bueno, atender a la problemática de la violencia contra las mujeres en los espacios públicos y en los políticos. Es muy fácil para un hombre participar en política, pero cuando una mujer participa en política desde lo más simple, como es el tiempo que tiene que dedicar a su actividad política, comienza a ser muy culpabilizada porque entonces está descuidando a los hijos y a las hijas. O sea, no tenemos en cuenta que las mujeres tienen el derecho a participar, 
porque se les imponen sus obligaciones tradicionalmente asignadas, como es el cuido, el cuidado de los niños y de las niñas, de las personas adultas mayores, de las personas con discapacidad, por, por arriba del derecho a participar. Y nadie les impone a los hombres obligaciones similares. Entonces, sí, tenemos que hacer un fuerte trabajo también en las representaciones sociales sobre el, cómo, lo que son las mujeres y cuáles son los derechos de las mujeres. Porque si seguimos, o sea, criticando desde una cuestión muy simbólica las mismas mujeres a las otras mujeres que participan en política, nunca vamos a avanzar. Y esas son también formas de violencia que no se visibilizan habitualmente. Vemos la violencia cuando golpean a una mujer porque quiere votar o porque se quiere postular o, 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 la, o la amenazan, pero no la vemos en eso tan simple como las críticas que, me, que recibe cuando desempeña funciones de carácter público. Muchas gracias. Thanks very much, Silvia. Tupaca, please. Maybe just to add with respect to success, successful stories, they are showing results. And uh, whenever we are seeing results, uh, uh, we are moved. Because uh, as mechanisms, we are also putting ourselves when we are going to countries, we are um, trying to see how to encourage country to apply those uh, accepted standards, how to, how to at the end see changes. And uh, let me mention, for example, my visit to Georgia. When I was uh, in Georgia, at that time, Georgia did not yet ratify the Istanbul Convention, and they were looking into compatibility of national laws with uh, regional convention. So they have uh, already done a part of the job during my visit. Uh, I have also uh, focused on those incompatibilities between uh, national legislation and Istanbul Convention, but also CEDO Convention. And basically, with uh, those recommendations, I was able to support the government in that process of harmonization of a national law. Uh, now um, we are in a situation where Georgia ratified the Istanbul Convention. It is, of course, a uh, uh, comprehensive convention and implementation is still uh, um, going to be challenged uh, to fully implement all those norms. But re with respect to uh, collection of data, I would also like to uh, pose uh, to that country because uh, when I was there, I also advocated collection of data on gender-related killings of women, femicides. And that was a challenge. Uh, first term was not used, femicides, and then it was not clear who should collect data and so on. But the uh, ombudsperson in Georgia decided that he would be the body to collect data on uh, femicide or gender-related killings, and he started the process. Then, when I met him at the United Nations at the level of the CSW, I was informed that uh, they were not able to progress with that initiative because they were not able to pass definition of femicide in their parliament. And then I was discussing with them how to solve the problem, why they need a definition. And I was suggesting that they do not need definition. They need to look at all gender-related killings of women and they need to look case by case in order to see if those cases of murders of women are gender related. And then the next step is to analyze cases to see what was not done properly by those who are involved in, in prevention, in services and everything else. And now I'm, I have been invited to go to Georgia on uh, 25th November in order to commemorate the International Day on Elimination of Violence Against Women. And I am going there in order to really send the message that they did a good job and this is something that should be addressed properly. So it is extremely important for me as a mandate to see results. Although it's not, it's not going to be an easy travel, it's far away and so on, but I think that I should do it. And I, I'm really glad when I'm seeing positive results. It is for all of us important to see that progress is possible, violence is preventable, uh, countries should uh, really acknowledge uh, with, with this kind of comparison who is doing good job and then they should compare uh, good practices. Thank you. Next question, please. Good morning, thank you, Elira Caballero from the Center for Reproductive Rights. Thank you so much for this uh, very interesting panel and very needed discussion. And I guess my first comment will be for Dubravka. You mentioned implementation and how important it is 
You also mentioned the terrible situation of women in El Salvador that are being imprisoned for obstetric emergencies and sentenced for up to 40 years in prison. That is a case that we are litigating at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Um, on this topic, we also welcome the latest press release from Inter-American Commission on Human Rights urging all states to adopt comprehensive immediate measures uh, to respect and protect women's sexual and reproductive rights but under the premise that the human rights should be protected by the states, how we can keep working with the states and with the mechanisms to keep pushing on this protection on human rights so they can be, so they can be held accountable and comply with all the conventions uh, that they have signed. Thank you. Great, thank you very much uh, for that question. And I think I will start perhaps with Dubrovka. Thank you. Thank you very much for this question. And on this question, I would like to point out, uh, uh, again, issue of cooperation between uh, global mechanisms like my mandate and regional mechanisms like, like Commission on uh, Women's Rights and uh, Belem do Para. Because uh, at the level of uh, monitoring mechanism, the situation is uh, detected as a problem. Um, I also uh, have information that uh, uh, rapporteur on uh, women's rights will travel to El Salvador very soon. So I would like to join her with my, uh, let's say, uh, support with respect to those um, uh, problems that uh, we are seeing as something that is very urgent because now we do have possibility to send the message that this is uh, not in line with CEDO Convention, this is not in line with Belem do Para, and this is not in line with Beijing Platform for Action. And action is really urgent. Um, so now I am... Uh, uh, going in direction of really um, joining um, forces of my mandate with forces of regional mandate and regional mechanisms in order for us to send a good message. But I'm afraid that this is not enough. So we have to see how to build more support on those critical concerns that should be resolved in a faster manner. I feel that those women that are in prison there for issues that are related to abortion should be released immediately. And how to do it? How to, how to persuade the government? Here we need maybe another level of support coming from other states, coming from high heads of uh, international organizations, maybe ambassadors. I think we have to build uh, jointly with non-governmental organizations that are doing great job here, alliance, in order to send a message that uh, some, some laws should be urgently changed. Thank you. Sylvia? In the case of El Salvador, o sea, es parte de nuestra región y el comité ha elaborado desde el 2014 una declaración sobre derechos sexuales y reproductivos y violencia sexual. Y en, ese, en esa declaración se instaba a todos los países a despenalizar el aborto, por lo menos en los casos de peligro para la vida o la salud de la madre, de malformaciones incompatibles con, con la vida y de, de violación. O sea, en el caso de El Salvador se está incumpliendo absolutamente con las tres situaciones y con el agravante de que cualquier mujer que llega a un hospital con un aborto en curso, y sabemos que los abortos espontáneos son sumamente frecuentes, se presume que intentó eh, provocarse un aborto y eso es un delito y solo por eso es encarcelada. Eh, el comité ha observado ya en el informe anterior la situación en El Salvador y va a tener una nueva observación. Lo que pasa es que muchas veces las asambleas legislativas de nuestros países y, y los gobiernos, o sea, dicen, bueno, esto no nos interesa porque nosotros tenemos nuestra ley y no, más, no se van a inmiscuir desde los organismos internacionales. Eh, nosotras creemos que es necesario como decía Dubrovka, ejercer una presión más fuerte. Y yo creo que no hay presiones que funcionen si no tienen eh, consecuencias económicas y que deberíamos buscar como los países que no cumplen con un mínimo de derechos de las mujeres reciben algún tipo de sanción económica. Okay, thank you. Next question, please. 
Mi nombre es Pablo Villeda y trabajo para la organización Misión Internacional de Justicia, una organización no lucrativa global que combate la violencia. Eh, un par de preguntas. La primera es, en el tema de los ejemplos positivos, ¿qué gobiernos han demostrado progreso en la implementación de mejoras y fortalecimiento de sus agencias locales de administración de justicia y seguridad pública como parte de las primeras respuestas del Estado para lidiar contra la violencia contra la mujer en el tema de eh, la protección y la deducción de responsabilidades penales y criminales por parte de los agresores. Estamos muy interesados en saber qué ejemplos positivos hay. Y la segunda pregunta es en relación a lo que mencionaba el señor Abrao en cuanto a los sectores que, sociales que a veces presentan resistencia a la agenda de género y particularmente en el continente americano eh, pensando en los grupos religiosos y las iglesias que son influyentes y reconocidos todavía como de los más eh, de, con mayor grado de credibilidad ¿cuál es el área común y el mensaje de invitación de eh, los actores de derechos humanos y contra la violencia contra la mujer en invitar a los sectores religiosos del mundo pero en el continente americano para unirse a, a esta lucha de una manera propositiva. Gracias. Okay, thank you very much. Paolo, I think that was directed toward you. Bueno. Tres comentarios breves. El primero, sobre la pregunta anterior, solo para eh, decir que de hecho la Comisión viene con, con pasos muy progresivos eh, en materia de afirmación de estándares sobre derechos reproductivos y sexuales. Eso viene de manera coordinada con los esfuerzos previos dentro de la OEA, que la propia Comisión Interamericana ya lo hace, el mecanismo de seguimiento de la Convención Berlín de Pará. Y, y es una materia que este año fue una de las materias principales en, en términos de avances de la Comisión, en posiciones públicas de la Comisión Interamericana de manera sustantiva al tema. Eh, sobre sobre uh, la identificación de buenas prácticas, eh, de hecho, Estoy de acuerdo de que eh, cada vez más tenemos que visibilizar las experiencias que están puestas de buenas prácticas y también de lecciones aprendidas en nuestra región. Una de ellas, sin duda alguna, es la inclusión de la perspectiva de género eh, en la formación eh, que se brinda a los operadores de justicia en la región. Y creo que ese es un mecanismo para se si, eh, agregar cada vez más conocimiento sobre los in estándares internacionales y la internalización de la orden jurídica nacional de la orden jurídica internacional que apunta obviamente algunas, a, muchas veces eh, estándares que son considerados muy altos para la realidad de determinados países la realidad estructural y la realidad cultural entonces para mí siempre el desafío está en cómo bajar a la tierra estos altos estándares intentar transformarlos en políticas públicas reales que van a ayudar a o a avanzar o a proteger o a permitir que la sociedad civil dentro de los estados puedan también establecer sus luchas internas y eh, estableciendo los diálogos que la democracia permite para avanzar en las agendas de derechos humanos. De manera que si, si, la Comisión tiene total interés de, de articularse con los demás mecanismos para hacer avanzar esa agenda el tema de, de El Salvador es una realidad que, que incluso para la Comisión es muy preocupante. Eh, de los países del mundo que prohíben, por ejemplo, eh, totalmente la práctica del aborto, tres de ellos están en nuestra región ¿no? es, eh, y, y es algo que, que nos preocupa. Entonces la Comisión tiene la disposición de actuar junto con la CIN, con los otros mecanismos, con el sistema universal para ampliar esa presión que hablaba la relatora y creo que se puede pensar muchas cosas ahí en esa, en esa materia. Entonces, eh, decirle que es una agenda prioritaria para nosotros. Podemos pensar mesas de diálogos para intercambiar buenas prácticas, podemos pensar visitas de trabajo conjuntos en terreno, podemos pensar en el mapeo de estándares que ya son comunes en, eh, en los diferentes mecanismos e intentar cruzar eh, mecanismos de seguimiento al cumplimiento de esas recomendaciones llegando a las autoridades estatales 
conjuntamente porque eh, y, y estoy de acuerdo que hay que, que, que tener la disposición de, de articular espacios de diálogo con eh, las organizaciones que también supuestamente representan un pensamiento contrario al avance en los derechos de las mujeres. Entonces, a veces también nosotros identificamos como los sectores religiosos, pero sin, sin querer eh, eh, banalizar o, o transformar eso como una regla. La verdad es que existen también varias organizaciones de carácter religioso que nos ayudan a representar una visión eh, distinta eh, en la defensa y, pa, y para el enfrentamiento de esta discusión sobre eh, la supuesta ideología de género que, que está creciendo en toda la región. Entonces, abrir esos canales de diálogo con la participación de los organismos internacionales ayuda a fortalecer las posiciones de la sociedad civil dentro de los estados para que ese diálogo también pueda salir de las disputas que a veces son políticas locales y, 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 y asumir una, un, una narrativa un poco más principiológica que ayude a, a saber identificar concretamente en cada situación lo que se puede avanzar progresivamente a cada coyuntura y a cada momento histórico, sin abrir mano, obviamente, de nuestros principios que siempre serán eh, nuestros orientadores para la búsqueda de una agenda máxima cuando posible. Paula, thank you. Um, I think what I'm going to do now, we have one more questioner who's been very patient, and after that we have some closing comments uh, by Carmen, and once we've heard the question and responded, I'm going to give all of our panelists a chance to put forward final thoughts uh, before we turn it over to Carmen for closing comments. So please, last question. Primeramente, buenos días. Mi nombre es Samila. Hoy yo trabajo para la ONG que llama Child Advocates and Women, Women's Rights International. Pero mi pregunta ahora será respecto de una realidad más de la Latinoamérica. La organización que yo trabajo tiene enfoque en Afganistán, en mujeres de Afganistán, pero mi, mi pregunta será basada en la realidad de, principalmente de Brasil, que yo soy brasileña. Bueno, en Brasil nosotros tenemos muchas políticas públicas que fueron creadas en los últimos años. Tenemos como políticas para protección de las mujeres, de monitoreo, tenemos muchas políticas y también tuvimos muchas leyes creadas en Brasil, como la ley María de la Peña, que es una ley, es una ley que visa eh, combatir la violencia doméstica. Tuvimos en 2015 la ley de feminicidio. Ahora los agresores que cometen feminicidios son culpados por este crimen, pero... Todavía, en los últimos anuarios que tuvimos, en investigaciones que tuvimos en Brasil, eh, los anuarios muestran que los, los estupros, las violaciones domésticas, las violencias domésticas, ha crecido, no ha disminuido. Pero en contraste, tenemos que en las capitales o en las ciudades que tienen más acceso a medios sociales o que tienen más conocimiento, las violencias han disminuido. El aumento se da en las zonas rurales. Y mi pregunta es esta. ¿Cómo podemos cambiar la visión en las zonas rurales? Que muchas veces las zonas rurales, las mujeres de las zonas rurales son olvidadas. Y bueno, como ya dice, tenemos muchas políticas públicas. Entonces no es por falta de, pol de políticas públicas. Pero el problema es que... Usualmente en las zonas rurales nosotros tenemos como las personas son conservadoras, incluso los jueces son conservadores. Entonces, ¿cómo vamos a luchar contra esta, esta realidad? Yo estuve en una ciudad chiquita en mi estado, en Minas Gerais, y fui a hacer una palestra sobre derechos de las mujeres allá. Cuando yo llegué allá, había una, una cita así. Ser mujer es ser un superhombre. Y es esto, yo no pude tener un diálogo porque las mujeres allá tenía, no tenían acceso, no tenían conocimiento, ellas no tienen conocimiento de los mecanismos que, nos tienen, que tenemos. Entonces quiero saber esto, ¿cómo cambiar la visión de las mujeres que se siente, eh, que, siente que la violencia es correcta? Que ellas son las culpables por la violencia y que la CIDH, la Comisión Interamericana de Mujeres, tienen hecho para cambiar la realidad de esas mujeres, principalmente de las zonas rurales. 
Thank you very much. That's a, a complex question and uh, very relevant. Silvia. Puesto el dedo en la llaga. O sea, ¿cómo hacemos para que las políticas públicas que diseñamos en las ciudades lleguen a las zonas rurales? Las mujeres de las zonas rurales, la, la primer, el primer problema que tenemos es la falta de información. Pero yo creo que hay un problema más grande que es el cómo vamos a mediar la información. Si yo llego con mi postura de mujer urbana académica y me siento a hablar desde esa posición con las mujeres, probablemente no me van a escuchar. Yo necesito primero escucharlas a ellas, saber cómo es su vida, saber, o sea, lo que necesitamos es educadoras y educadores populares que puedan llegar a esas regiones, fundamentalmente mujeres educadoras populares, que puedan llegar a interiorizarse con cómo esas mujeres ven la violencia. Nosotros tuvimos una experiencia de trabajo en una zona rural en Costa Rica con mujeres indígenas. Y cuando las compañeras llegaron, esas mujeres le dijeron, acá no hay violencia. Y tuvieron que trabajar como un año con ellas para que las mujeres empezaran a comprender la realidad que estaban viviendo y a leer su realidad desde otro lado. O sea, yo creo que es un trabajo muy, muy lento y muy, muy difícil de hacer porque tenemos que entrar a conocer cómo piensan las personas en las áreas rurales, cosa a la cual no estamos acostumbradas. Eso por un lado. En segundo lado, el asunto de que los jueces y los policías también son así. Yo en el caso de los jueces y los policías haría dos cosas. La primera sería llevarles información, ¿verdad?, de explicarles, tratar de sensibilizarlos. Pero si no responden a eso, hay que sancionarlos. O sea, son, son funcionarios públicos y los funcionarios públicos tienen que cumplir con las leyes de los países. Y si no las cumplen, deberían haber formas de sancionar a esos funcionarios públicos. El otro problema que tenemos en zonas rurales es la falta de acceso a los servicios. Es muy fácil para una mujer de un área urbana salir de la casa y caminar uno o dos kilómetros y encontrar un lugar donde va a ser atendida. Una mujer rural tiene que salir y caminar cinco o seis horas a veces antes de llegar al primer lugar donde puede hablar de su problemática y donde tal vez no reciba la respuesta adecuada. ¿Cómo hacemos para llegar a esas áreas? Ni pensar en una campaña por Internet o por Facebook, porque no tienen Internet. Con costos podrán tener una radio porque a veces no están electrificadas esas zonas en nuestros países. O sea, necesitamos diseñar mecanismos especiales para ellas, materiales mediados para que ellas los entiendan. Hay problemas de analfabetismo en muchos países, o sea, los, los, los materiales no pueden ser escritos, tienen, tienen que contener muchas ilustraciones, poco texto y cosas a las que ellas puedan acceder. Mientras no hagamos ese tipo de trabajo, y es un trabajo, lo repito, muy largo, muy lento de hacer y muy difícil, no vamos a tener éxito en las áreas rurales, porque ahí estamos interceptando muchos factores de vulnerabilidad frente a la violencia, no solo el hecho de ser mujer, estamos interceptando pobreza, estamos interceptando exclusión, porque son zonas excluidas en todos nuestros países. Entonces, eso requiere de algo que va más allá de trabajar violencia. Es un trabajo que requiere, que requiere trabajar la exclusión, ¿Cómo hacemos? O sea, yo les puedo decir cuáles son sus derechos y cómo pueden usar las leyes y dónde lo van a aplicar. O sea, debería haber, por ejemplo, equipos móviles que visiten esas zonas, no sé, se me ocurre. Pero tenemos que diseñar mecanismos mucho más complejos para que esas mujeres tengan realmente acceso a su derecho de vivir sin violencia. I think that's a great uh, spot uh, to move to our final um, round from each of the panelists at this point. I'm going to invite each one to provide just one or two closing comments and final thoughts. We've covered a lot of territory this morning. Uh, there's a long way to go. But I'd just like to quickly begin by saying um, we have some excellent tools. We've heard about them this morning. We've talked about ways to improve them. Our governments are engaged on this. It is our job to push them to do more not just governments, civil society, communities, uh, everybody needs to be involved in this. There's no silver bullet. It's about continuing to move forward. These kinds of conversations are incredibly important. And I'd like to take a minute to thank every one of our panelists, not just for the work that you do, but for the very fact that you do it, that you are public people, that you are women, that you are men who are gender aware, 
who are out there in the public demonstrating what is possible, normalizing the fact that men and women have a role to play on this and that women have a role and a voice in decision making and in public policy. So thank you for that. Don't stop. Carry on. We all count on you. It's extremely important. I'd also like to take a moment to say uh, that as chair of the Permanent Council, Canada will be hosting an event on December 6th. Uh, December 6th is a very important day for Canada. There is not a country in the world that does not have a problem with violence against women. And that fact was made abundantly clear to Canada in 1989 on December 6th, when 14 women who were students of engineering were gunned down just for the fact that they were studying, just because they were women at school. That galvanized the women's movement in Canada. It changed the way we talked about gender violence, and it, it ratcheted up the priority that we placed on it. Nonetheless, the problem continues in Canada to this day. December 6th has been declared a national day of mourning, a day where we remember the victims of gender violence and where we challenge ourselves to do better. So this December 6th, under Canada's chairmanship of the Permanent Council, we'll host a special event at the Permanent Council. You're all very welcome. The intention is to hear from governments, what are they doing now, how are they seeking to move this conversation forward, and perhaps we can pick up on some of what we've heard this morning. How can we use the tools that already exist, the solid international frameworks that we have, the commitments that our governments have made, how do we work better together to move this conversation forward? We have made tremendous progress, and I think we should all feel very proud about that, but I think we need to continue to push forward and do more. So um, thank you, Carmen, and thank you to the Secretary General for organizing this. I'm going to give each panel member a minute or two to make a few final comments, and then uh, we will turn it over to you to close. So shall we start, Paolo, with you? Please. Muchísimas gracias por la oportunidad. Es siempre bueno tener estos espacios para reafirmar más una vez que la violencia contra la mujer es una violación de derechos humanos. Esse resultado, obviamente, sabemos de uma consequência de uma discriminação que é histórica e estrutural, pelo que, apesar de isso, há que saber que é uma violência que é, sim, evitável. E é possível evitar, e nós temos que seguir articulando nossos mecanismos para alcançar esse, esse objetivo. A Comissão reitera sua disposição de acompanhar os Estados, a sociedade civil, os outros mecanismos regionais e internacionais de proteção das mulheres, responder a las víctimas, sus representantes en nuestros mecanismos y nuestras actividades y, 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 y enfatizar la importancia de, de establecer de manera cada vez más eh, creciente las actividades de cooperación técnica con los Estados para ampliar las capacidades de protección de las mujeres dentro de sus propios territorios a partir de esta dessa amplitude de diversidade da discussão que nós tivemos. Talvez o melhor é um para nós, um dos melhores exemplos que hoje nós temos e que é concreto dessa disposição da Comissão a trabalhar em matéria de cooperação técnica para o fortalecimento institucional da proteção das mulheres. É nosso projeto com o Canadá. Aproveito a oportunidade para agradecer à embaixadora, que é um projeto com a CDH hoje que nos permite um conjunto de atividades que tem essa ênfase, esse objetivo de ampliar as capacidades da sociedade civil e dos Estados em la proteção dos direitos das mulheres. Eu creio que é um bom caminho e estamos integralmente à disposição de los demais colegas para seguir adelante conjuntamente. Muito obrigado. Obrigado, Paulo. Felipe, por favor. Obrigado muito. Eu também gostaria de agradecer por essa wonderful oportunidade de ouvir uns aos outros e de aprender uns aos outros e de, de fato, underline nossos existentes compromissos para o combate da violência contra as mulheres em todo o mundo. Agora, eu gostaria de dizer que, tendo ouvido algumas das perguntas, as perguntas e os comentários, I really believe that we need to uh, enlarge uh, the scope of the treatment of this notion of violence against women uh, to beyond uh, the um, area of even women's human rights area. In that, uh, wh what I'm saying here is that, for instance, if we look at the very latest uh, uh, general recommendation of the CEDAW Committee on Gender-Based Violence Against Women, 
we see that very significant steps are already taken. CEDO committee is now saying that uh, gender-based violence against women and combating uh, gen gender-based violence against women is an, inter uh, is an inter customary international law obligation in the world. It is also saying that certain crimes, sexual crimes particularly, like uh, rape and uh, other kinds of sexual harassment are, uh, and other forms of uh, violence against women, uh, may amount to torture, cruel and inhuman uh, treatment of um, individuals. And similarly, uh, in some cases, these crimes can be uh, can come under the chapeau of international crimes. So it is important to underline the, um, the salience of the matter with regards to other uh, spheres and to draw new alliances and to uh, make uh, 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 use of other forms out there, of other forces out there to defend this particular cause. Secondly, I would like to say that uh, there is never enough done and never enough uh, accomplished to raise awareness. I'm listening to some of these questions. Women do not know their own rights. They don't know how to uh, um, report and all that, or, or they think it's their uh, fate to be faced with uh, violence against women. Of course, this is all true. And to be honest with you, I think uh, despite all the international norms and the national legislations and policies, the places where these policies, these norms cannot reach, oddly enough, the backlash against them reaches faster. So these women uh, uh, who don't know about the norms or about the policies or the mechanisms that are available are faced with the added, many times all around the world, with the added force of a, a, um, of a backlash that is really uh, uh, fighting them and th that uh, reinstates the subordinate role of women and underlines the subordinate role of women. So this is something we should be aware of and that we should specifically address our uh, works to. In this fight, in this uh, uh, matter, I think uh, something that we have not spoken very much today but is very important is that uh, a men's engagement needs to be there. It is, we cannot do this uh, with women only and uh, we cannot do it also by simply asking men to help us do it. We have to have men who are uh, men's organizations and men in power positions who uh, truly embrace the idea and uh, fight for it. So men's uh, awareness raising men among men is as important as awareness main, uh, raising among uh, women. And, uh, Finally, I would like to say that all over the world, and it's not only in Latin America or in, the, um, in uh, South America, but all over the world, we are seeing, uh, as part of this backlash, a, um, an effort to um, uh, an effort to misrepresent certain what we would so, uh, call sacred values. Uh, or uh, religion, in other words, to, and it uh, misrepresents to the extent that it is many times uh, hijacked. I mean, religion is hijacked in many contexts. This is, uh, this is happening in the Muslim world. It's happening in uh, parts of uh, Latin America. I know from, uh, you know, CEDAW reports, from the work of uh, even uh, uh, Gravio in Europe, from other contexts. So there, should, uh, there needs to be awareness raising about this. And for that, I think women's organizations, those who fight against uh, violence against women, should cooperate, should look into efforts to better de uh, uh, find alliances among um, uh, groups that are uh, in the uh, communities uh, that do not uh, are in these communities but do not engage with the extreme interpretations uh, of religion or ideology and that is something that I think we need to look more into in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rede. Dubrovka, please. 
Thank you. In closing, I would uh, like to um, suggest that uh, this panel was a very important step in direction of strengthening cooperation between uh, global and regional mechanisms that are dealing with violence against women. Uh, today you are seeing only three of us, but in the future I hope that it will be seven of us and that we will have a uh, possibility to have regular meetings for uh, exchange of uh, knowledge, practices, plans and uh, joint efforts in order to properly address uh, violence against women. Um, I hope that this is a uh, beginning of, of something that will give good results, but we need your support. We need support coming from all levels, from global organizations, from United Nations, from regional organizations like Organization for American States, Council of Europe, African region. So we need this type of support. Uh, with respect to um, challenges and what should be done. I would like to uh, just briefly mention that I arrived uh, to Washington from Africa. I was attending um, a session of uh, African Commission on Human Rights and the uh, launch of the new guidelines on prevention of sexual violence. Uh, and I see these guidelines coming from African part of the world, addressing violence during the peace time and conflict time as a very important tool. Now I would like to see how all of us, how can we support African region to implement that uh, set of guidelines. But they have also provided something very important in those guidelines. They are calling all states to, uh, to elaborate their national action plans for implementation of those guidelines. And I, I think that this is the way forward. Now with all those instruments, global and regional, we have to encourage states to uh, elaborate new generation of action plans that are going to be um, data informed with proper data collection, with proper allocation of money, with mapping of resources that, uh, services that are needed. So action plans that will really connect global and regional agendas with realities at the national level and progress much faster in direction of really preventing violence against women because violence is preventable. At the global level, I have called for global implementation plan on violence against women. I do think that we do not need new Beijing platform um, for action. We have Beijing, but we also have all other instruments. Now, at this stage, we need to collect and connect all those informations and to connect the dots to use this better and to go in direction of implementation. Implementation is now a challenge in front of us that should be properly addressed. Thank you. Bueno, primero agradecerle al auditorio por aguantar tanto rato con tanto frío y por hacer preguntas tan importantes. Segundo, sí creo que esto ha sido un, una oportunidad única de intercambiar experiencias y de conocer mejor lo que hacemos en cada lugar. Y yo quisiera cerrar haciendo un llamado a que enfaticemos en la prevención. Para los países es más fácil invertir en atención de la violencia porque se ve de inmediato, ¿verdad? Atendimos tantos casos, se resolvieron tantas sentencias, eh, hicimos tantas publicaciones... Eso se nota, pero cuando hacemos prevención, la prevención es de largo plazo. Y si no empezamos ahora a trabajar con nuestros niños y nuestras niñas en construir relaciones de género igualitarias entre ellos y ellas, en educarles en respetar los derechos de las otras personas, no vamos a conseguir erradicar la violencia. Entonces, nuestro trabajo fundamental tiene que ser dirigido a las nuevas generaciones que no tienen tan eh, interiorizadas las diferencias y las desigualdades y que en, en quienes podemos encontrar un campo fértil para sembrar un mundo nuevo, un mundo donde los hombres y las mujeres seamos iguales en derechos y en oportunidades, aunque diferentes individualmente. Un mundo donde podamos decir que las cifras de violencia bajan en vez de subir, yo no sé si suben realmente o si lo que sube es la denuncia por el trabajo que hemos hecho. Es algo que también tendríamos que estudiar. Donde todas las personas nos unimos para trabajar mejor 
y juntas y donde, y donde aprovechamos el potencial de cada uno. Porque si no hacemos eso, vamos a seguir teniendo problemas de desarrollo, vamos a seguir teniendo problemas económicos y vamos a seguir teniendo violaciones de derechos humanos de las mujeres en todo el mundo. Muchas gracias. Bueno, muchas gracias por este fantástico panel y quiero, quiero recoger algunas de las cosas que ustedes han dicho, pero como ha sido esto tan rico, va a ser imposible recogerlo todo. Yo solamente me quiero referir a dos elementos. El primero es la coordinación, las sinergias, la, la cooperación que se está estableciendo aquí y que creo que vamos a llevar más adelante. Y creo que eso es un área muy importante, y tanto la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos, como, como el MESECI, como el Grevio, como Dubranca y la relatora. Eh, yo creo que todos podemos hacer eh, un esfuerzo, y espero que con el apoyo del secretario que nos ofreció hoy podamos el próximo año reunir a las demás organizaciones con nosotros. O sea, que yo veo esto como el principio de una etapa de colaboración donde podamos llegar más adelante. La segunda es sobre los desafíos. En los desafíos, además de todo el tema de cambiar el paradigma, cambiar la mentalidad de todas las personas, lo que también tenemos que hacer es contrarrestar los ataques a los derechos de las mujeres. Creo que lo más importante que está sucediendo ahorita, además de tener que luchar contra la violencia hacia las mujeres, es tener que luchar contra todo ese embate eh, fantástico, muy bien financiado, contra los derechos de las mujeres. Y son todos los derechos, no es un derecho, son todos, empezando por la igualdad. Entonces, esta, esta idea de que esos no son derechos y de que... Eh, eh, no hay que hacer todo, todo lo que estamos haciendo, que los derechos sexuales y reproductivos no deben de tocarse ni de hablarse de ellos. Todo eso son ataques que se están concretando en ataques diarios a todas las ministras de la región. Todos hay grupos muy organizados en toda la región que andan de gira llevando panfletos y llevando información equivocada convenciendo a la gente que no tiene realmente ninguna educación de que ellos tienen la razón. Y como dijo Pablo, hay que atacar eso. Yo creo que ese es nuestro gran desafío y entonces unirnos nos va a ayudar muchísimo. Quiero agradecerles a todos ustedes y a todas ustedes que estén aquí todavía. Algunos ya se han tenido que ir. Y quiero agradecerle a nuestros panelistas que hayan viajado de tan lejos y que estén aquí con nosotros. Muchas gracias.